And we're here for podcast number seven with the amazing Jordan Chow. Hi, thanks, Ramsey. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. If uh, you do not recognize this man, you have not seen um, my self-defense video series on MMA fighters testing women's self-defense techniques, which um, is probably the most popular thing I have on YouTube right now. That's what got, that, I think I thought that's what got... That's what made you <laughs> build your fan base, pretty much. I know, man. I've had uh, had this YouTube channel for like 12 years and, you know, fairly, fairly small following for such a long time. But then all of a sudden these uh, these self-defense things just uh, just kind of exploded. Largely thanks to you, my friend. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> a, a lot of people on the internet... Um, uh, affectionately know you as the crazy Asian guy because of the, the way that uh, that you just go over the top uh, testing out these techniques. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't mean for that to happen. I just did it for humor purposes because um, the first self-defense video that we did was the Krav Maga one. It was a poster that we saw in the gym. Yeah. And uh, I know Niels was there and then you want to debunk it. So he just said yeah just stab me i was like, okay so i was just doing this and then i eventually just started doing crazy things yeah and that <laughs> that video got so much negative feedback from krav maga practitioners they were like oh that's not real krav maga how dare you insult our style or or whatever um but there there really was this poster advertising a uh, a actual krav maga seminar and the poster had these uh these guys doing these poses showing these techniques like fighting people with knives and stuff that were just absolutely terrible. I mean, stuff that would get you killed in real life. And we just wanted to point that out in, uh, in a video form. So, yeah, that over-the-top performance had me rolling on the floor, man. And the thing about these uh, self-defense videos is that they always make it seem like it's so easy to, to do these techniques. Like, they expect the person to just stand there, not do anything, while yeah. you attack them. Yeah, man. If um, if you spend like just a minute, just a minute, like just sparring live, not even against a violently resisting person, but just somebody who's not being a pushover, and you learn very quickly, fighting is not the fantasy demonstrated in these self-defense videos at all, mm -hmm. or in movies. Yeah, because like, yeah, I mean, life's not like the movies where you could take on like twenty guys at the same time. I mean, it's it's entertaining to watch, but is it realistic? Yeah, or those, um, all those movies that came out between the 1980s to the late 90s where, you know, the antagonist would stand still for like three seconds with his hands down while the hero would, would prep to do this triple flying spinning kick to the head three times in a row. And in, in reality, you're just tying yourself out when you do that, or you probably just fall flat. <laughs> you know, or you know, use that energy to just run away, actually. Yeah, yeah man. A lot of people told me like the best self-defense actually is just cardio, it's just run. Because <laughs> they can't attack you if you're like all the way down there and they're still, oops, sorry, they're still here. <laughs> so. Yeah, we got these, uh, I got these new pop filters because in some of the uh, the previous podcasts, those pop, pop sounds were just a little, a little over the top. So la, 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 la. put this, uh, this little screen in front of the microphone to try to prevent that from happening. So hopefully it, it, it does work. Hope you audio <laughs> listeners uh, at home would appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, uh, going back to Krav Maga, I remember that like a couple of years ago, uh, when I first went to your gym, I remember there was a Krav Maga guy that came to the class yeah. to do a demonstration. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Remember Let's that? Let's talk yeah. about that dude. Yeah. So um, yeah, he came in like a he was wearing camouflage pants <laughs> <laughs> or camouflage <laughs> like. He's not a real self-defense instructor unless he's got the camo pants on, man. And uh, that's the thing about Krav Maga. They always wear that. It's like their belt system. It's like, <laughs> it's like a black belt. Uh -huh. The Krav Maga black belt is the camo pants. We're offending so many people on the internet right now. <laughs> but yeah, so the, this guy, he wanted to show... Because he, he wanted to start teaching there. And I remember he told all the MMA fighters to like come about. He's like, okay, everyone watch. And I remember he gave Bjorn, a, was that a knife or yeah, a gun? It was, it was a rubber knife. Yeah, it was a rubber knife. And he was telling Bjorn, okay, I want you to you know, pretend this is real. Like, do 
what you would do in a real fight. I gave the knife to Nelson and asked uh, Bjorn to react as, as if he would in a real fight. Uh huh. And, and then Bjorn was like, okay. He's like, help! This guy's got a knife. Someone help me. And then the... Which is actually a smart thing to do. You would do that, right? You, yeah, he starts you, running away, making a lot of noise. Help, police, help. Yeah, exactly. And you stay away from the attacker. But the, the instructor was like, no, no, no. You have to like, get the knife from him, right? And yeah. then so obviously Bjorn did, but he got, he got stabbed. And then... Uh, <laughs> so I, I, Before that, though, Bjorn said, uh, he said, why would I do that? He has a knife. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight him. He's like, the, the Krav Maga instructor's like, but... but Pretend you have to. He's like, why would I have to? He's like, just do it. Just do it. He's like, okay, okay, fine, whatever. <laughs> and yeah, and eventually he got stabbed, right? So then... Many, uh, many times. Many times, right? And then, I remember he told you to stab him, the instructor. Yeah. And <laughs> oh, man, that was, uh, th- that, was, that was interesting because he, he handed me the knife. And th- this was after mo- most of the people had left because I, I was just kind of scratching my head watching this whole thing. But... He handed me the knife afterward, and he's like, let's see what you have, Mr. Instructor. And so I just come up and, like, stab him, like, 50 times. And he's, like, flailing around trying to grab the knife. And uh, he's, he gets frustrated, and he's like, let's do it over again. You're not, you're not stabbing right out of run over, so I switch my stance and, you know, stab him a different method, like, 50 times. And this goes on several times. Then he snatches the knife away. He's all mad, and he's like, basically, well, let's, let's, see, let's see what you have, Hotshot. You try to take the knife away from me, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a knife-fighting expert at all. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not ignorant of what knives are and, and what to do with them, but uh, I took my shirt off because, you know, one of the... If, if you are, for whatever reason, going to engage somebody with a knife, put something in between you and the knife. And so I took my shirt off, and he's staring at me like, what the heck are you doing, trying to kill me with your muscles? Um, so I hold the shirt out in front of me and the guy stabs at the shirt, not at me. And I wrap up the knife in the shirt and, and actually catch him in a shoulder lock and put him on the floor and, 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 uh, you know, have him tapping out and he wants a mole again. And I like do the a very similar thing again. And, and, um, th- this is kind of shocking because again, I'm not a knife fighting expert. And every time I've done a drill like this, where I, I hand a knife, a rubber knife to a completely untrained person and have attempted to disarm them. I've always been stabbed like at least a dozen times. Uh-huh. And so to have this, uh, this expert just completely <laughs> unable to even get a slash out was, uh, man, it was laughable. Because they think, uh, one thing I noticed about, not just Krav Maga, but all those self-defense videos is that, because in reality, people attack like, they stab like this. They don't stab like one strike or they don't do that Norman Bates attack where they do this. Especially not in slow motion, man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> the overhead sure. slow motion robot psycho attack. <laughs> or even like a punch. Like there are some videos uh, like, uh, uh, okay, we'll, we'll get into like the Wing Chun part, but because I, I started from Wing Chun and then um, I remember on YouTube, I wanted to look at other Wing Chun videos. This is a long time ago. And a lot of times, it's, oh, this is, how you, this is how you block a jab. And the guy just steps there and slowly throws a punch and then you do this, you do that, you duck, you kick, you do a, f- a flip and everything. <laughs> uh, okay, not a flip, but you know what I mean. And I was yeah. just like, really? But the thing is that some people were actually, who are, who were, or who are not experienced enough, they'll actually believe that. They'll say, hey, maybe yeah. that does work. So that's the thing about these videos is that they're very dangerous. Yeah, I, <laughs> man, I, I've read some interesting comments this morning on some, some of the uh, self-defense videos I posted. This guy said he actually went to a class where the instructor handed out knives and uh, he said, all right, attack me. And the guy starts stabbing at the instructor. The instructor like stops him mid-class and starts lecturing. That's not how you hold a knife. And, uh, you know, the guy was so young and had and very inexperienced and he just kind of accepted it for granted. Okay, I guess that's not how you you hold a knife because that's how the guy with the black belt is is telling me to do it. And and he said years later, you know, when he had more life experience, he, he just uh, checked himself. He was like, what the heck was I thinking? <laughs> How could you? I mean, of course, you know, if if some bad guy on the street is trying to kill you with a knife, I mean, he's going to hold it however he wants. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you can't tell the opponent, "Hey, can you hold the knife like this, not like this?" Because it's easier for me to disarm. Yeah. So you can't, you can't do that, right? So I remember back in Canada, because uh, that's where I'm from, and then I moved to China. But I remember. Uh, when I again, when I just first started, uh, I knew uh, one of my friends who was a Cali instructor, yeah. and uh, his name is Sean Tyler, and uh, basically, he was teaching like the basics of night defense, 
And then at that time, I was like, okay, so you should you block? Should you do this? And he's like, no, because uh, if you just do that, you're just going to get stabbed. And I was like, well, what about against like a Muay Thai fighter? Can it just knock you out? I said, and he was like, yeah, but I mean, at the same time, there's that <laughs> risk of getting stabbed. So the best defense is just run. Yeah. Right? And I, I never thought of that. I was like running. I was like, oh, okay. And I think still people don't realize that. Like they can just uh, run away. Yeah, we don't see a lot of action movies where, say, Jean-Claude Van Damme squares up with the bad guy and he's like, uh, yeah, and then sprints out of there. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> yeah, because in mo- for movies, it's not entertaining if we see people do that. Or like Steven Seagal do that. <laughs> but he's running away. It's just like, it's not really fun. <laughs> they, they, they could make movies like that, though. I mean, there was, um, what was it, one of the last, not the last James Bond movie, one, one of the more recent ones, um, Remember the uh, the opening scene was this big like parkour scene where there there's this big oh, casino foot chase going on. Casino and, Royale, and that that was a great scene. Uh-huh. I mean, people love chase scenes when there's a lot of action going on, and that's literally what it was. A guy uh-huh. running away from from a fight, and they made that look really cool on 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 film. I mean, uh, maybe if there was a string of action movies where they made running away look super cool, I mean, maybe uh, that would have an effect on the self defense industry. That that. that. That's, that's a good point, because I know there's another parkour movie. It's a French one called uh, B District 13. I'm not yeah. sure if you're, have you seen that one? No, it's I a, haven't it, seen that one. It's with Jamie Bell. And um, I, I forgot the premise, but I know there's a lot of parkour. In it. And in the very beginning, there's these thugs trying to break into his, uh, his apartment. And then what he does is he just runs away, and he, he avoids getting shot. He just jumps through windows. So, I mean, uh, but obviously, you have to be an expert in parkour so I don't expect random people to actually jump out the windows <laughs> or, or off like the ri- off the buildings or yeah something. that takes a little bit of training it's not something you can just pick up by watching a, a video on, on YouTube man mm-hmm. in fact really I would say nothing about self defense or, or very very little technique wise is something you can pick up from a five minute video mm-hmm. and that's uh, that's um, I mean when Jordan is actually the guy. He sent me that video with the um, Marie Claire five tips every woman should know to defend herself or whatever it's called. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that <laughs> yeah. We made that video that just kind of went viral. And Joe uh, Rogan posted it. Yeah, and Joe Rogan retweeted it. And, and man, uh, thankfully so, because that, that's how I got so so much of, uh, of my internet audience because they were like, hey, Joe Rogan thinks it's funny. Let me check this out. Um. Ended up on World Star Hip Hop as well, and all these other websites started linking to it. Um, but yeah, Jordan sent me that video, and I started scratching my head like, "Man, this is this is so bad." And and I showed it to my wife, and my wife is a she's a very intelligent person. I mean, she is she's not a dummy by any stretch of the imagination. But I showed her this video, and I I, I didn't say anything. And after I, I said, "So so, what do you think of this?" And she said, "I think it looks pretty good." And she said something like, I, I, feel like uh, I feel like I'm more confident about defending myself after watching that. And I was like, oh, man, I got to do something about this because this video is just absolute garbage, like just showing the most garbage techniques that not only don't work, but, but quite literally put you in a worse situation. And so, um, yeah. And the, yeah, and the, I remember the attacker in a video was like gently attacking the person, it wasn't like with with intentions yeah. to kill. And, and even against the most minor resistance, resistance, he would just like flop over and roll on the floor in a way that uh, nobody ever, ever would in real life. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Again, that's the thing about those self-defense videos. Not just that one, just the other one from Split Second Survival. Split Second Survival. Oh man, those guys were amazing. <laughs> Split Second Survival, if you guys are listening, we love you. Um, we, we appreciate what you do. And we hope that you make your Facebook page public again. So you that guys the public suck. Can, come on, Jordan. So, so the public can appreciate your amazing video collection. They have like 300 videos. It's this group in Anchorage, Alaska. And, uh, and I know a lot of people on the internet make fun of them, but I, I genuinely think they're, they're pretty cool. And here, here's why. Because they're, they're not your average self-defense group, like, you know, put your hands here and put your hands there, and you'll, then you'll get away from the bad guy. I mean, they, they, they ramp it up to 11. They pick the absolute worst case scenarios you can possibly have, like three guys with guns pointed right at you and seven guys with knives on you, and then you have to John Wick your way out of that situation in the most impossibly crazy way possible. Oh man, it's uh, it is amazing. It's very entertaining to watch. So, but 
there's a reason why it's called split second survival. It's probably because you only survive for a split second. Because the video, the videos, the videos. Yeah, and then the guy puts a gun at me. I just push it. I turn. I take this gun. I shoot him. I shoot him. I shoot him behind me, and then I walk away. It's like really, or the mount defense. The, the the mount escape defense. Oh yeah, yeah. we we did make a, a video response to one of their one of their amazing videos before they before they uh, pulled down all their all the content. Uh, where this guy they're like, what to do if you have an assailant mounted? How to escape from the mount top position? And if you're not familiar with jujitsu or mixed martial arts positions, mount is when you're on top. It is one of the most advantageous positions in fighting. You have all the advantages, all the weapons. The other guy has one option, which is try to escape while covering up and, and, not, uh, and trying to minimize the damage, essentially. And they're telling you how to escape from the most advantageous position. And <laughs> their solution was like, give the guy a, a wet willy, rub dirt in his face. And like, <laughs> um, or he said fall limp. I mean, I oh, yes. He just falls. Fall just, limp uh, and roll over. <laughs> Allow the other guy to basically roll on top of you. <laughs> just, yeah, I mean, e even a bottom position. Yeah, he was, he was like tickle the stomach so you get distract, you get distract the brain, and then <laughs> oh, yes. from there you can push him off. Oh, man. Just, I, I love these guys who teach like how to how to like pressure point strike out of a mount position. It's a uh -huh. oh man, just like it's the, precious. Yeah, I mean pressure points do do work. I mean, they're because like, I like like under the nose, the eyes, the groin, yeah. under the ears. You know, uh, cause but those they things they don't work the way most people seem to think they do, though. Yeah, yeah, because in order to use to apply the pressure points, you gotta use pressure. You can't just go like this. You know, you have to really do it or really dig it in. So it's just like that that last self defense video that we debunked yeah. for, uh, for our, our Star Trek because we're Trekkies, and uh, <laughs> yeah, they, uh, whoever made that video uh, must be like. Star Trek fans or something like that, you know, <laughs> just pinch the shoulder and the guy just falls. Oh yeah, I mean, these guys were quite literally demonstrating the Vulcan neck pinch that Spock did on Star Trek to to make people just fall down completely unconscious. Like if a bad guy approaches you, just gently give him a sacrocranial massage <laughs> with your thumb right behind the right behind the scalp, and he'll just be putty in your hands. Like <laughs> no, or or like the leg. Oh, oh yes, just squeeze his squeeze his quadricep ever so slightly, and he'll just he'll just turn into a quivering mess on the floor. Because uh -huh. <laughs> um, as I said before, I started from Wing Chun. My teacher Brian Port, Port Swartznik. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, I know so Wing Chun. There are some pressure points applied. Uh, there are some pressure points in it, and I know one of them was in the in the arm. But he, I remember he told me like even so, it's very difficult to get from a resisting opponent. Because yeah. you know, if you no one's gonna let you grab their arms, be like, okay, wait, wait, oh, there it is. They're, they're gonna be fighting back. Oops. Yeah. And the, the type of grip strength you need to apply that specific pressure point in the forearm is uh -huh. tremendous. Uh huh. Yeah. So you, I mean, for any type of pressure point, you gotta really know how to use it when the opponent is resisting. And sometimes it'll work. Sometimes it won't work. So. And I, I had a friend in college. He was a he was a marine, and this guy was you know really strong, and and you know pull-ups and push-ups and all this stuff every day and just a lot of grip strength and and he saw me practicing some taekwondo forms one day and he says hey let me let me show you something i learned in the marines and and he grabs my my forearm and just digs his thumb into it and i'm like ah just screaming because you know it hurts when you dig stuff into <laughs> into soft tissue with a lot of force but i can't emphasize enough a lot of force not just a it, that, that's not something you're going to learn on, on by watching a video. I mean, that is mm -hmm. something you you gain over time through through persistent practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, YouTube is very educational, especially when it comes to like learning techniques. But you got to know how to do it, so or or at least like find a training partner to do it. Because I know a lot of like jujitsu. There's a lot of jujitsu videos or yeah. Muay Thai or you know, all kinds of those videos on YouTube. And then when you look at it, you're like, okay, but does it really work? So and I know, like one of them was a rear naked choke defense, was where you pressed your head against the guy's chin. Oh yeah, Lady and, of America, self defense. <laughs> yeah, and I, we, we got to do more of those, man. They got like six other videos that are amazing. Uh huh. Because I remember what um, my ex colleague, uh, she does uh, jiu jitsu with uh, Eunice actually, yeah. BJJ. And I show her that video, 
and, and she's a white belt, so I just wanted her to look at it and say, okay, what do you think of this technique? And she's like, oh, okay, it looks good. It looks good. I'll try that next time. I say, okay, you can try with me, <laughs> right? So and this is in the office, so I just choked her. Now, I mean, I didn't really squeeze her. I just gently, and she did it. She, she did it really hard, and I didn't feel anything. And then she was like, oh, okay, it doesn't work. I was like, don't believe anything you see on a video. But I'm like, I'm glad you tried it out and you know that it doesn't work. So, yeah. So, so. Every time we're about to make one of these self-defense videos, I, I run it past my wife first and I ask her, what, what do you think? And, and that one in specifically, she was like, you know, I, that seems like it should work because the chin is really sharp and pointy and, you know, you, forearms can be sensitive. Uh -huh. It looks like it would work on me. I'm like, well, do you think it would work on a guy like twice your size who... Um, and so we tried it out, and she's like trying her darndest to like pinch my arm to death with her chin, and you know, no, no effect whatsoever. You know, not even mildly inconvenient. Uh huh. And it'll, it'll probably work against children, but you know, if, if a child's choking you, yeah, but not like a grown person. Yeah, the most hilarious things about those Lady of America videos is the fact that uh, her training partner is this big, giant dude who looks like a, a linebacker, football player. Uh -huh with these huge beefy arms bigger than her waist and, and she does that and he's like, ow, ow, oh man, that hurts so much. Oh man. The amount of acting involved. Is acting. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is like, when you show these people these self-defense videos and they believe it, you know, can you really blame them? Because they don't know much about it and that's what I think they'll assume, they'll get this belief that it does work when it really doesn't. Like, um. Another good example is that, you remember that video I posted of those, did you get your black bar in Kmart? And the, the, taek, oh, yeah. the karate or taekwondo guys kicking each other. And then they, they, had, like a, they had the Street Fighter music on. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, for those who don't know, yeah, there's a video. Is that the one where they're just going back and forth, throwing sidekicks, like yeah, missing yeah. by a foot, but like they, they look very serious. Yeah, and yeah, they do like, it for like five minutes. just Like that, they do that. And then they do a form in the end, and then somebody edit the video with like they shoot fireballs. <laughs> or something like that. But is, is that the one where everybody's like doing the form slightly differently? Kind of, yeah. It just doesn't so match like, up. Or... Like that's like rapid punch like that. Uh, okay, anyways. Oh, man. Uh, but yeah, you can Google it. I mean, so you can YouTube it. It's on YouTube. But anyways, I showed, I was watching that video uh, again at work and uh, it was through WeChat because I remember I was watching it and then my colleague was somehow just walking past me and I, and I he was watching it and he's like, oh, did you get your black bar I'm sorry, did you get your black belt in Kmark? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> and I was, and I didn't tell him first. I was like, what do you think of this though? Right, and I was holding back because it was so funny. So I was trying not to laugh, but he was like, oh, it looks, it looks okay. And <laughs> I, I didn't criticize him for that, right? I just said, oh, okay. But I understood from his point because, you know, he, because he has no martial arts experience. So he doesn't know what to expect. But he was yeah. wondering, like, what does that mean? Did you get your black belt in Kmark? And I was just like, uh. Yeah, for the viewers not from North America, Kmart is or or was is Kmart still open in North America? Not not in Canada. Okay, I think yeah. I, I heard they may have gone out of business, but uh, Kmart was a um, a chain of uh, stores, department stores, where yeah. you could go and buy cheap clothes and um, whatever. Other yeah, general merchandise. Yeah, those, those type of things, electronics, and uh, actually, going well going off topic because I know Kmart was big in Canada, but then, you know, Target, yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't know if you noticed, but it actually replaced Kmart in Canada, but then within like a year, it went bankrupt Really? in Canada, and then it went out. And I didn't know that because I'm living in China, uh, I, and sometimes I go back to Canada to visit, and I noticed it says, oh, Target's coming to Canada. I was like, oh, okay. And I heard Target is like a, a, a more upscale version of Walmart. Yeah. So I was like, okay. And then a year later, I came back, and it was gone. And I was like, well, what happened? <laughs> and yeah, so it's, it really surprised me that, but apparently, I guess, I guess the market is just different or yeah. everything. And, uh, and Canada yeah. is an interesting place from a, uh, a American perspective um, coming from the, from the United States. You know, it's kind of interesting. We've had more Canadians on this, this show than any other nationality so far. Um, yeah, three so far, I think, including Jordan. But yeah, as, as an American, it's, it's fascinating talking to Canadians because... Um, Canadians sound so much like uh, like Americans. They they the culture is, is probably more similar to uh, to American culture than than any other country in the world. But then all of a sudden they'll say something ever so slightly different, 
And you'll be like, wait a minute. What planet are you from, man? Aboot. Aboot. <laughs> kind of Aboot. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, well, I, well I, I, the Canadians that I, I don't, I, that I know don't speak like that, but yeah. <laughs> maybe like other parts do. But one thing I find, like, I know it's going off topic, but one thing I find funny is that everyone always stereotypes Canada, Canadians as being friendly and Americans being like violent. But I always find <laughs> it the opposite. Because whenever, yeah. you, whenever you ask an American, what do you think of Canadians? They all say, oh, they're nice, they're very friendly they're so people. polite. So polite. But when you ask a Canadian what they think of Americans, oh, they're so violent, they're so aggressive and everything. So <laughs> I always find it, well, maybe can, it seems like Canadians are the mean ones and Americans are. <laughs> it's those Canadians perpetuating the stereotypes, man. Yeah. But man, I've, I've got some, some family, some cousins up in Canada in um, Vancouver, BC, and uh, every time I've gone to visit them, I'm, it's, it's like... Uh, this is almost like the United States, but then, then like something will just like be different. It's like, man, I just walked into the Twilight Zone. It's like, it's like the U.S., but it's not. I'm in a foreign country all of a sudden. What happened? Uh, that's true, actually, because I just came back from California last month, and um, I noticed that they sell they sold alcohol in like convenience stores and things like that. Because Canada, yeah. they don't. Oh, really? And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so even that was a big culture shock to me. So I was like, oh, nice. Yeah, you know, in the last 10 years, I've only been back to the U.S. three times. And since, since I go back to the U.S. so infrequently, if uh, anybody's just tuning in, we were in Shanghai, China. And, uh, you know, I've lived here for about 10 years now. Every time I go back to the U.S., uh, it feels like a foreign country to me. And I experience this, the, I guess you could say, reverse culture shock. I look around, I'm like, wow, America's so weird and different and strange and foreign. And I get that feeling too, actually. And the convenience, because yeah. Shanghai is so big and so convenient. I mean, like online shopping, you could do same day delivery for like no charge or like one day, whereas back home, it's like seven days or seven to 10 yeah. business days and you gotta wait for it. So, but I mean, each place has their own advantages and disadvantages. But it is a reverse culture shock when I go back as well. Yeah. I think what, what really shocked me the most, uh, one, and I'm sorry, my American friends, but the, the level of obesity in America was just absolutely shocking. I mean, it, it's something I grew up around. So, um, you know, just seeing enormously obese people was, was like normal in my mind. But after coming to, to China, where the average person is is fairly slender, I would say, going back to the U.S., I was like, man. There is, they are not kidding about the 60% adult obesity rate here. That is shocking. I noticed that in the United States, the portions, whenever I go out for dinner, is, is huge. <laughs> and I like, love American portions, man. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do like it too, because I like to eat a lot. And I remember I went to this restaurant, and I was like, okay, I'll get a burrito, and then a side salad. And they said, okay. And the side salad was actually bigger than a burrito. <laughs> uh, and the burrito was huge too. And I was just like, this, this is a side salad? And they're like, yeah. And my American colleagues were like, yeah, I mean, isn't that the same size as Canada? I was like, no. So, Burritos the size of your face, side <laughs> salads, bigger than your stomach, man. It's a. But I find that Americans are like much bigger and stronger compared to Canadians. Interesting. I know, I know, I know that. I, I hear this from a lot of uh, a lot of non-Americans. Like when I first came here to China, they would always say, oh, "Americans are so strong," and I'd be like, "What? Really? No, we're not." <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I, yeah, that's what I would. I see. Right. Speaking I see. of giant portions, there there is this restaurant. It's in Orem, Utah, on State Street. For anybody out in Utah, it is called Joe's Diner, and it is probably my favorite restaurant in the world. I've only eaten there once because I, I don't make it back to Utah very often. I went to went to school out there, but Joe, he's this uh, this fellow. I think he's from Alabama. I'm guessing he's from the South somewhere. But he set up a diner there. They're open for breakfast and lunch, and they have the most enormous portions. Like I went in there, and I wanted an omelet and a, st- a short, uh, a stack of pancakes. So I said, I'll, "I'll have the full stack of pancakes and the omelet." And he said, "Oh, you can't eat the full stack of pancakes with the omelet. No way, sir. You want the short stack." And I said, no, "I'm pretty sure I want the full stack." And he's like, "No, no, no. You want the short stack if you're going to have the omelet." I said, all, all right, fine, I'll, I'll have that. And he's like, and that comes with grits, and that comes with toast, and that comes with unlimited refills on chocolate milk. And, and anyway, he brings out this omelet that's made with what looks like two dozen eggs and a pound of cheese and, and a pound of meat. And, and 
It's just like <laughs> it's like a whole meat platter. It's like it is giant. It's like enough food to feed an entire family. And the short stack of pancakes, I kid you not, is like it's this plate that probably weighs like ten pounds of just stacks and stacks of pancakes, like fifty of them. I'm like, this is the short stack, and he's like, yes, sir, that's the short stack. I, can you I super, told you. When I, can you supersize that? <laughs> oh man. I, can't even imagine the tall, the, the tall stack. So did you finish it? I, I did. I did because I, in, in spite of not being a particularly large person, man, I can eat. I can eat. Uh-huh. <laughs> I usually like to spread those calories out through the day, though, in like six meals or so. But uh, that's what, Yeah, that's why when I was younger, I used to really like to go to buffets a lot because it's just all you can eat. And uh, I know a lot of them at that time, when I first moved to China, I was like, is there any buffets here? And a lot of my friends are like, well, you know, in China, they don't really like to stuff their face. Like, uh, Chinese people would rather pay for like quality than quantity. And I was uh, like, is that really true? But I can't really think of many buffets here in Shanghai. Whereas uh, in, in Toronto, there's so many buffets. There's buffets there. It's like, it's everywhere. Yeah, buffets are, they're, they're rare here. And coming from the United States where there are Chinese buffets all over the place, that was kind of disappointing not to, not to find the same thing here. I mean, there are a few like fancy upscale hotels that have a buffet and their their restaurants there. Um, but those and, you gotta pay a lot. Yeah. yeah. But the interesting thing is, Chinese hotels you can actually go to just for the restaurant sometimes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because I know some. Uh, I do know some hotels where you have to be like members or like yeah. you're staying in a hotel. Uh, you gotta show them your room card and everything. Some of them have some pretty amazing restaurants, actually. Mm-hmm. In Shanghai? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of good restaurants here in Shanghai. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, because when, uh, again, when I moved, when I first moved to Shanghai, it was a big culture shock. And, uh, but, so it took me a while to get used to the food, the no, the no buffet thing. But one thing that surprised me the most was the lack of martial arts schools. Because... Oh, yeah. Because... Uh, yeah, you know, I, I moved in Shanghai. I moved to Shanghai around 2010, and in Canada, you know, MMA was big. There's jujitsu gyms all over the place. There's Muay Thai gyms. So when I came here, I was expecting it to be the same, especially for a city of like 30 million people, right? Which is a lot. You know, Toronto only has three million, so yeah. that's like 10 times the population. Shanghai is the uh, biggest yeah. city in China, the most populated country on planet Earth. It's huge. Yeah, and um, uh, so I was expecting a lot of gyms here. And I remember I Googled, or, or yeah, I Googled it, or binged it. I can't remember if it was Google was banned at the time. And I could only find one jujitsu gym, which was Shanghai BJJ. Yeah. And I was and like, they were still super small at the time as well. Yeah, yeah. And they only had one location because now they have. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. Now they're all over the place. Yeah, they have several locations, but um, uh, at that time there was only one location, and it, it was, I lived far from it too. Like from Metro, it took me like over an hour to get there. So doing that, imagine like two, three times a week. Is it could be very time consuming, so but I remember um, I, I did go there once just like to try it out, and I did like it, but because I was just so busy with work, I just didn't, and it was just so far, I didn't eventually stick stick with it. Yeah. So that's why I started with Wing Chun because I lived closer to 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 see for Brian, and that's how that's how my Wing Chun journey began. Yeah, so you started yeah. Wing Chun here in in, in China. In China, yeah. And if, if you don't know anything about Brian, he's a, he's a German guy. Mm-hmm. which kind of shocks a lot of people like what why are germans teaching a chinese martial art but but weirdly i've i've actually met a lot more foreigners who teach wing chun than chinese people in okay fact, I, I think i've only met one one chinese guy who actually teaches wing chun at least um at least uh in any respectable uh level yeah even in toronto actually there's a lot of foreigners or non sorry foreigner non chinese people who teach wing chun as well, because when I go, because um, because sometimes when I when I go back, I like to train when I'm there, and so I, I just Google it and I say, okay, I'll, you know, this looks like a good school. And I know that they're like non-Chinese people, but the, the thing about Wing Chun is that there's different lineages. So I'm not sure if Tyler talked about this, but um, because uh, Tyler was a guy who came before me for the yeah, podcast. Tyler, the Wing Chun pilgrim. Yeah. So and he's a, and uh, he was my training partner for a long time, and he's a really good Wing Chun guy, and um. Because we learned from, we both started from Brian, and he comes from a German uh, lineage, and there's a lot of like um, politics going on between German Wing Chun and Chinese Wing Chun. I'm not sure if you noticed. Did, did Tyler talk okay. about this? Or? No, no. Okay, 
Tell uh, us all about it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, ger- uh, I mean, German Wing Chun, because uh, I know some Chinese people, they criticize it. They say it's not real traditional Wing Chun because it's more revolution. It, it's more, it's, it's like a, rev- a more, yeah, like revolution style of, of uh, Wing Chun. And, you know, they change a lot of the forms, so it looks different. Uh-huh. But the reason why it, it's like that is because my Wing Chun teacher, Steve O'Brien, he said that, because fighting evolves. It's not like, it's times are not like back in the 50s where people just stand there, throw a punch, and that's it. The The fighting now is like fighting changes. That's why people are doing MMA, jiu-jitsu, boxing. So the attacks on the street are a lot more vicious. And for that reason, that's what German Wing Chun does. It adapts to it. Whereas Chinese Wing Chun, like not to offend anyone, but apparently it doesn't. Yeah. And um, so, so th- th- there's a lot of hate going on between like the German uh, I keep touching this thing it's like, <laughs> Jordan it's like, likes to gesticulate and karate chop while he talks it's a Wing Chun <laughs> uh, reflex but anyways um, as I, I was uh, saying uh, yeah so, so Wing Chun as he talks <laughs> and um, yeah so there's a lot of like controversies going on or a lot of hate going on between German Wing Chun and Chinese Wing Chun yeah and um, when I because when I first so after I lived in China my contract finished at my company, so I went. I went back to Canada for a bit, and I wanted to continue pursuing Wing Chun. So I found this Wing Chun school in Northern Toronto, a city called Markham, and it's very traditional Chinese Wing Chun. And I thought I'd try it out, so I signed up for one month, but I only went there for two weeks because it was so bad. Because <laughs> I, I remember we're doing drills like uh, there, there's a drill in, in Wing Chun called Chi Sao, and uh, I don't know, what you, sticky hands. Is that the sticky hands thing, yeah. Yeah, and th- they're okay there. Th- those guys were really good. They were fast. But when it comes to like sparring applications, they kept telling me I was too strong or I was too much of a boxer. <laughs> and they're like, you can't, you can't punch like that. You have to punch straight like this. And I was just like, well, in a real life situation, and I'm a, I'm a nice person, right? So when I spoke to the Sifu, I wasn't disrespecting him. I just yeah. said, uh, okay, Sifu, but you know, in the streets, no one punches you like this. They'll, they'll do it like this. And he's like, well, that's true, but that's why you have to, use, you have to be soft. You can't be too strong while you do Wing Chun. And so you have to be very, like, water. You have to be like water, like Bruce Lee said. So I said, okay. Uh, so I, went, I remember I went up with their, one of the most advanced students. And, again, I wasn't punching like this. I was doing, like, the regular, just jab, cross, jab, cross. And I noticed I kept touching him. Like, I wasn't punching him. I, I was, it was like those shoulder drills where if you touch the person's shoulder, yeah. if, you, if you touch the person, it means, like, you, they got hit. I just kept doing that. And then I could tell he got frustrated, right? And I was yeah. like, well, because you're too soft. You need to be more, you need to block, you know, use strength where you block. And yeah. that, that, and yeah, and that was the thing about that type of Wing Chun because it was, it was like traditional Wing Chun and it wasn't for me. I was just like, I'm sorry. I mean, I didn't tell him this, but I told my parents, I was like, yeah, I'm not going back there. <laughs> yeah, I think that that type of... Um you're going too hard, you're using too much strength. That's endemic of not just Wing Chun, but so many martial arts. You'll, you'll see that in a lot of jiu-jitsu schools as well, for example. Um, not all of them, pro- maybe not even the majority, but I, I've visited plenty of, plenty of Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools where, where they're like, they de-emphasize strength. Or, or maybe not the schools themselves, but often the practitioners, the individuals will... will uh, try to save face by by using the most backhanded compliment in martial arts oh you're so strong <laughs> oh man and yeah it's actually not it's actually an insult when they, yeah. they say that to you yeah essentially they're saying you didn't beat me because you're better you just beat me because you're physically gifted genetically or whatever and yeah and i notice a, a lot of times they'll say things like technique is more important than strength and you don't need strength when it comes to grappling and i Again, when I first started, I actually believed that. But now that I think of it, like Big Dave, for example, is a good example. Yeah. But Big Dave Williams, he's um, this big American. He's like 120 kgs, pure yeah, muscle. He's, <laughs> he's a strong, strong dude, man. He, he's a juggernaut, pretty much. And so imagine rolling with a juggernaut. And, uh, and his techniques are very basic, but he's just so strong. And he, he taps out like purple belts, too. I remember yeah. he, at Shanghai BDJ, he was tapping out... Uh, I can't remember how, one purple belt and some blue belts, and but that was the thing. I mean, like, because uh, they because I can tell the students were very they felt I guess discouraged that they yeah. they lost to a white belt. But I was like, well, I mean, look at your size. You're like 
half his size. He's just pure strength. So yeah, man. If if Dave gets a hold of of your arm, man, he'll straighten it out. He'll he'll find a way to armbar you. Yeah. Uh, Dave told me this uh, this story. He went to a, a jujitsu school. At, I'm not sure which one. But he rolled with one of their purple belts and, and tapped him out. And then the coach ran up to that purple belt and started yelling at him like, you don't deserve that purple belt for tapping out to a white belt like that. I'm like, man, he, Dave's not <laughs> a white belt. Dave is a, uh, how can I put this? He, he's essentially a black belt in lifting heavy things, man. <laughs> he has a black belt in strength. Uh-huh. Um, so, man, there is, there is no, no shame to tapping out to a guy who is like literally six times stronger than you. Yeah, for sure. Because um, everybody's, everybody's um, like um, everybody weighs differently. You know, we're st- uh, you know, and I know some people say, oh, you know, jujitsu can always defeat a bodybuilder because there was like videos of it. I don't know. I don't know. Have you seen it? It was like a, I think it was one of the Gracies. He submitted a a big bodybuilder. Probably thinking of Pedro Sauer. There's a popular video of Pedro Sauer fighting a bodybuilder. Okay, it's, it must it's be It's a that fight, one. not just a jujitsu match, but they're they're fighting. Okay. You know, striking and, and jiu-jitsu. Oh. And Pedro Sauer, I mean, he's not just a jiu-jitsu guy. He's like one of the jiu-jitsu guys. I uh-huh. mean, he, the Pedro Sauer lineage is, is such a strong lineage in jiu-jitsu. In fact, um, my old coach, Mark Brewer, uh, he's a black belt under Ricky Lundell, who's a black belt under Pedro Sauer, who's a black belt under Helio Gracie. And Pedro was just the man. I mean, he still is to this day. Um, so his jujitsu was was just phenomenal. So him, you know, beating up a bodybuilder, absolutely not surprising at all. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, I I didn't know. Yeah. I think I've seen. I've heard, I've heard of him before, but I'm not. I can't picture his face. Yeah. But like him, Eddie Bravo, or like other people, they are they are actually, because I I know a lot of jujitsu guys. They're quite small. They're not like muscular. They're or they're yeah. not like seven feet tall bodybuilder type. And and yeah, they can defeat. They can submit like bigger guys. But again, those are exceptions because they're really talented. They're like really good. And they have spent so many years practicing to do exactly that. Right. Ex- exactly. They, yeah. they didn't just watch a, a quick video on the internet. Five <laughs> tips to beat bodybuilders. <laughs> oh, the Mary man. Claire one. Do this. <laughs> tickle, tickle the body. Distract the brain. <laughs> distract the brain. Oh, man. But, um, uh, so, oh yeah, what was I talking Oh yeah, so yeah. So, and I know a lot of people always say like, is it okay for a higher belt to tap out for against a, a a lower belt? Yeah. And in my opinion, I do think it's okay because there are a lot of because there are a lot of white because I've seen it before. But main reason is because usually like the lower belt either they just have more knowledge or they came from a sambo background or or they have or they're just talented people. Like some people are just so talented they learn really quickly or they're they're just naturally strong. So I, th- uh, so I think it's okay. Like, do you think it's okay to agree with that? Or? Yeah, well, here's the thing. If your arm is going to break, tap out. I don't care what fashion accessory that person who is about to break your arm is wearing, tap out. If your neck is going to snap, tap out. Doesn't matter if the dude snapping your neck is wearing a black belt or a white belt or a rainbow <laughs> fluorescent belt with stars and glitter on it. I don't care. Rainbow. If you're in trouble, tap out, man. One of the best pieces of advice I ever heard was from Ricky Lundell, again, amazing, amazing coach. He, he wrote the following, um, if you want to improve your jujitsu, roll with everybody until the white belts can submit you. And, you know, people holding on to that, oh, I can't ever tap out to lower ranks. You know they're holding them, themselves back. If if you get on the mat and just honestly express yourself and give it everything you have, until the weakest, wimpiest, smallest person in the room can tap you out, then you're going to learn something about jujitsu. Speaking speaking of Big Dave, you know that that giant juggernaut of a guy. Um, you know he came to class once and there were a bunch of people like half his size and. You know, in, in the class that day, there were like uh, 30 people in the class. just, And he was towering over everybody. I was like, man, if, if we start sparring, he's just going to squash everybody. Prob- probably not going to learn much from that experience. So I decided, we're going to do a shark tank with Big Dave in the middle. So we put Big Dave in the middle. And I'm like, all right, everybody has 30 seconds. Um, you can start in the most advantageous positions, back mount with the rear naked choke in place and everything. Anybody who can tap out Big Dave... 
gets a free pair of MMA gloves, and everybody's like, yeah, I'm going to start from back now with my hooks in. And Dave just, like, shrugs his shoulders, and people, like, go flying across the room, and he's not even trying, just, like, taking, you know, just grabbing by the scruff of the neck and just like flicking this. them away with his fingers and, you know, <laughs> not, not even trying to hurt anybody, just, like, <sighs> flexing, and people fly off. And, and 47 and a half minutes later, he, I mean, this... There's a big misconception that big, strong people don't have good cardio. I mean, Dave had cardio for days, and he... Uh, he, he runs, he works out a lot, like almost every day. Yeah, and this guy can sprint, and he's fast, and, you know, just a very well-rounded athlete. And so finally, 47 minutes later, you know, just just uh, no breaks, just fighting consistently from the worst possible positions. Uh, this This kid, Jamie, he was the smallest guy in the class by far. Finally, finally... Gets Dave to tap out to rear naked choke. 47 minutes later. And Jamie was super proud of himself. Like, yeah, I got the big guy. In. And afterwards, Dave walked up to me and he shook my hand. And he said, thank you so much for that experience. I learned so much from that. More than I've ever learned in any other class I've ever taken. And the reason for that, he did exactly what Ricky Lundell teaches. Roll until the white belts can beat you. Roll until the weakest, smallest, wimpiest, least experienced person can beat you. Then you're going to learn something, not just about technique, but you're going to learn something about yourself and your own limits. That's a good point. I never, th- yeah. yeah. That is a good quote, actually. <laughs> That's an amazing yeah. quote. That man. is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. because uh, there are a lot of, because on my Facebook, there's a lot of news feed, and people always say things like, yeah, you should never tap, you should never tap out to a lower belt or things like that, because, you know, but I feel like, you know, it's, uh, it's, okay. it's I think it's okay to do it, uh, unless if, you're like at a McDojo, I guess, or something like that. <laughs> and, and yeah, because um, there are, unfortunately, some BJJ schools that are becoming McDojos. And uh, yeah. I remember, actually, again, uh, well, I was in Hong Kong, and it was, just, it was just like small MMA gym that was there, and it had like a BJJ program. And I went to Hong Kong for my visa, because yeah. uh, for foreigners, we had to go to Hong Kong for visa runs. And so, and this is like a long time ago. This is when I was really into training. So I found the MMA gym and I noticed there was this guy and I was, again, I'm not like a good jujitsu guy. I'm still a white belt. And there was this one foreigner there. I was rolling with him and it was Noki. And he didn't tap me out, but I, I know he was going hard because um, when you roll with people, like like you can feel that when they're playing around with you or when, when they're going really hard. And I noticed yeah. he was going hard. So I didn't tap him out, but he didn't tap me out. And after the round finished, he's like, oh, when did you get your purple belt? And I was just like, uh, I'm, I'm still a white belt, actually. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay, well, you're good then. <laughs> like that, and I was just like, okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that school in particular was a McDojo, but I was just like, it started bringing questions to, to yeah. me as I bought this gym. No, all, like, all Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools are definitely not created equal. I mean, I I, I visit as, as many as I can, and I, I notice, man, you'll, you'll see this right away. Some of them train very seriously. Like you go to some gyms and like the white belts with one stripe on their belts are just killers and other places yeah. the black belts are pushovers and Yeah. And uh yeah, it's it's just Is it because like though some people are just naturally gifted or like they're just so good that they get promoted faster? That's it's uh I mean there's so many variables in that. It's it's the way they train, it's why they train. Yeah. Um like I went to this one gym where they had uh like Everybody there was like had gold medals in national tournaments and whatnot, and everybody there was a killer. And this other gym where it was more like um, I don't know, no, nobody there competed, and so I guess their goals were just radically different. And at the non-competition gym where it was like self-defense Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it, again they were they were kind of pushovers. Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I get it. that's that, that's a good point because every gym, every instructor has their own goals or the way of teaching or way of um yeah yeah pretty much your own goals at the same time it's bizarre to me that the the self-defense oriented gyms are usually the worst ones because people in the comment section of my videos on self-defense they'll always say rams you don't understand in a real life street self-defense situation it's so much more intense and and dangerous than than a sport fight and sure so why aren't we training for that super dangerous situation instead of oh i don't know fighting a compliant person who's going to roll over and and uh congratulate you on on how 
sharp your chin is, like Brian Fury, for example, man. Or how awesome you can go limp. Tickle go the stomach, the interrupt the brain. Yeah, exactly. Because, uh, yeah, because that, 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 that is a good question. And because um, I remember I was, I was talking among this with my friends and then about like how I was saying, you know, I've seen white belts get promoted to blue belts within like six months. And they only train maybe like, they don't train every day. It's just like three times a week. And then one of my friends was saying, okay, well, yeah, that is true. But some people, you know, are just gifted that they deserve it whereas others aren't. And I'll say, and we were talking about like, cause from a business perspective, cause one reason why, especially in Shanghai, you know, there's two gyms, Shanghai BJJ and Absolute MMA. Uh, and I, I don't know if um you know the politics going on. I, I've heard a little, <laughs> let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> okay. Since neither of us really have a dog in that fight. Yeah. Cause I, I still talk to a lot of people from Shanghai BJJ. Cause I, I, cause, um, I, I was a member there f- like for about a year. This is like a couple. This is like yes. Yeah, as, as far as I understood, there was some type of falling out over like belts and promotions, and they kind of broke up and went and uh, separated in two different gyms. I that's the story oh, I heard. Oh, so really? That I didn't know actually. You you, you tell me your version. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you mine. <laughs> well, because um, because um, Eunice, who was the first person uh, as yeah, guest he was on speaker, podcast number one, and uh, he was he's my jujitsu coach, and that's how I met him through Shine BJJ. This is like two years ago. And so I still keep in t- touch with um, him along with my other friends who, who trained or who used to train there or who still do. And they always say things like, um, so they always tell me things about like politics going on. And from what I heard was that Absolute, uh, which is another MMA gym, uh, the instructor, Solo, I think. Yeah, yeah Solo. I mean, he's, he's a great guy. And uh, he opened his own gym. I sense a butt coming on. <laughs> Yeah, he opened his own gym, and then I noticed there were some people from Shanghai BJJ who went to Absolute, and I was curious about that. I was like, oh, it's like, why is the case? And they always tell me, uh, again, it was because of belt promotions. Like, one person, they didn't get promoted in Shanghai BJJ, so they went to Absolute, and they got promoted there. Or, uh, or I also know one guy from Absolute who went to Shanghai BJJ for, again, similar reasons. Interesting. And yeah, and I was just like, oh, okay. So, but again, I mean, because I'm not a member. I mean, I, I don't want people from both gyms to be like flaming on me or everything. <laughs> like, what the hell, Jordan? What the hell is that? <laughs> That's all wrong. Like that. But this is just what I heard. And um, there's so much politics in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, regardless of the school, man. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Man, so, uh... yeah. But I mean, like, but I mean, both gyms are good because I know people who, who go there and. You know, I'm not criticizing both gyms, so they are good. You know, Eunice, Stan, the, the instructors from Shine PJJ as well, Solo, they're very good teachers, so keep up the good work. It's just that... I, I yeah, every, they'd have different um, standards for belt promotion, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I think everybody, or like every individual, every student, just has their own... I won't say their ego, but their way of thinking. They'll, they'll be like, oh, I feel like I should have gone promoted already, but I didn't. Whereas yeah. uh, some people just have that, and they're just impatient. And so I wouldn't say maybe it's the school's fault. I would say it could be just like personal preference. Like some people just prefer that gym over this. Yeah. Or, yeah, so. Bel- belts are so weird. Uh-huh. They are so weird. When, when you start comparing yourself to other people anyway, that, that's where it gets weird. If, um, I mean, to, to, to me anyway, the significance of a belt is essentially an agreement between you and, and the instructor or the coach who gave it to you. And, you know, that's, that's cool and all that. But as soon as you start comparing yourself to other people, like, well, well, I have this color belt and that guy has this color belt and I'm way better than him. So what's, there's a problem here. And there's always going to be uh, discrepancies in skill level between, uh, between different people wearing the same color belt, man. Mm-hmm. Fashion and accessories, man. <laughs> and also a lot of, I noticed, um, cause I was reading, it's like, um, cause the, because I, I want to talk about belts since we're talking about it, like gi and no gi. Yeah. And there's a, uh, there's a debate going on. You know, if, you, if you're a blue belt in no gi, does that mean you're a blue belt in gi or, or vice versa, right? So when you, because when people get tested, usually it's just for the gi and that's it. Yeah. But they're, they're saying like maybe they should do two tests. So like if you want your blue belt, you got to do good, you got to do it in no gi and gi. Or type of thing. That's, but, that's an interesting point because I've met plenty of people who were actually really good with the gi, who kind of suck without it, 
and uh-huh. vice versa. People who are just awesome at flowing around, doing cool stuff without the gi, and then you put it on them, and they're they're just like trapped in a spider web. I can't move. I don't know how to break these grips. <laughs> He's grabbing my collar. What do I do? No. Exactly. I mean, it, yeah, it, it is a different ball game when whenever you're wearing a gi or not, because they can grab you, they can stall. Whereas no gi, they can't grab, or if they try to, it's just like. If you're sweating, just like yeah. Then you have right some up. animals like Josh Barnett, for example, who did not train with a gi at all. He was a catch wrestler, and we should totally talk about catch wrestling here. This is a great segue. Anyway, Josh Barnett, catch wrestler, uh, phenomenal athlete, never trained in a gi once in his life, and wanted to compete in a jujitsu competition. And so he was given an honorary black belt, and he went out there with the gi for the first time and just dominated everybody in his, his division. And, uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that was kind of surprising to me because the first time I put a gi on and went into a gi competition with a no-gi background, yeah, total opposite. You know, I couldn't break the grips, and I felt like I was stuck in a spider web like those guys I was telling you about. Man. Same with me, because I, I started off with no gi, and then that's when I went to the gi. Because uh, at that time, I was on a budget, so I didn't want to pay for a key. But I remember they were like, you know, you, that's what, like, the real jiu-jitsu training comes, it's the gi, mainly. So I said, okay. And it was just so different. I was like, people were grabbing me. I was like, what's going on? But, I mean, eventually you get used to it, but it, it still took some time to adjust. Yeah. If, if you've never grappled in a gi, if you're not familiar with... Uh with why that's different or why it matters. The uniform is, it's this very thick fabric and you can grab any part of it, which gives you uh, all of this extra control over your opponent. You can use it to attack, you can use it as a weapon, you can use it to control. So it changes the game substantially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for, sh- for sure, it's a different game. It's a di- totally different game plan when yeah. you're doing the gi no gi. Which is something we don't have a problem with at all in catch wrestling, something which both of us are quite interested in. Let's, let's talk about catch as catch can for a minute. Okay. Uh, catch, yeah, catch wrestling, I actually didn't know what it was until not too long ago. Or, uh, and I, I noticed, because uh, I'm on Facebook, there are a lot of catch wrestling groups or wrestling groups that I joined, and so it's, it's always on my news feed. And there's always like, sometimes they share videos with each other. And one thing I noticed that annoys catch wrestlers is they say, when you see a video and it says, oh yeah, watch out this cool jujitsu technique, but it's clearly not a jujitsu, it's catch wrestling or it's judo. And people say, and people say things like, yeah, I guess jujitsu is every, every type of grappling art, which is, which is not because there are other grappling arts besides, even besides catch wrestling, sambo or, you know, things like that. And I think that's the thing about um, nowadays is that with, whenever we think of grappling, we automatically think of jiu-jitsu. Yeah, and largely thanks to the UFC. In fact, entirely thanks to the UFC. If, if um, you know, the UFC was, was probably the best infomercial for a martial art ever, ever made. Um, I agree. <laughs> man, if, if it was catch wrestlers instead of uh, Gracie jiu-jitsu practitioners hosting the UFC, I think catch as catch can would be what Brazilian jiu-jitsu is today. Everybody would be like, oh yeah, we're going to the catch wrestling gym and that, that would be normal. Uh-huh. But, and then jiu-jitsu would be the outlier. Like, oh yeah, well, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is cool too and, and we have some moves. And that, that, that is a good point. Because um, before MMA got famous or before UFC got famous, I remember even though there was boxing, kickboxing, but whatever you think of martial art, you always think of karate or taekwondo. Yeah. So even if you throw a punching, if you're hitting a punching bag, people say, oh yeah, you're doing karate. It's like, no, it's doing kickboxing. But when when UFC came out, that's when people are saying, oh, it's Muay Thai. Uh, any striking arts now Muay Thai or kickboxing. Yeah. And karate, taekwondo are now losing its, uh, I guess, popularity. I guess, pop- popularity, I guess. Uh, which is unfortunate because yeah. you know there are good karate schools and taekwondo schools out there because again it ha- now karate has that negative stereotype you know the wax on wax off yeah. but and i used to actually think like that too when i was younger and i was inexperienced but when i it wasn't until i came to shanghai and i met people like joseph for example uh who's a, who's from spain he's a black belt karate and oh, yeah, yeah. I, and i've also met other karate people from from my wing chun school they transitioned to 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 wing chun and those guys are really good and when they spar they're, they're, it's not like a typical, huh? They they spar like very open. Yeah, it's like very the, fluid. 
Yeah, it's pretty fluid. And Joseph is a good example. Like he was sparring against like more like good Muay Thai fighters, and you know he gave them a really hard time. So uh, so that's what kind of I guess ignited a spark <laughs> in my head. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, that's what made me say, oh, okay, so you know karate isn't used to this after all. It's really good. And uh, but it's just that some a lot of people they always get that negative way of thinking. It's like oh, it's karate is useless. And I still know some of my friends back in Canada. They still say that, and I say no, it's not useless. It's good. It just depends on like the training or the teacher you have. Yeah. So I I love catch wrestling. Jordan loves catch wrestling. We we do catch wrestling drills all the time at, at our gym, and. I, I'm very tempted to simply advertise uh, my grappling classes as catch wrestling instead of as jujitsu because, but uh, at the same time, what you call your martial arts uh, when you advertise it will change your clientele almost 100%. And right now, what is, what is popular in China, what, what people look for as far as grappling is Brazilian jujitsu because that, that is what they... Uh, understand that that's what they use in the UFC right they've never heard of catch wrestling um, that's true and like from a marketing perspective you want to get students because if you advertise yourself oh yeah we're seventh uh, planet <laughs> kung fu praying mantis it's kind of like what is that even though it could be super effective it's like what is that but if you just say oh Muay Thai seventh it's like planet. oh okay yeah I'm signing up for that <laughs> That's the best name for a martial arts school ever. Seventh Planet Praying Mantis Upside Down De La Hiva Monkey Guard. Um, I don't know. Just making up techniques here. But yeah, as as you're saying, like a, a lot of people don't know what catch wrestling is, even in Canada. Yeah. And uh, and it does kind of bother me in a, in a way because they always think, oh, jujitsu. And yes, I love jujitsu as well, but there are other grappling arts as well. Oh, yeah. And like Josh Barnett is a good example. When he defeated the Dean Lister, yeah, Dean Lister, right? And uh, he's a catch wrestler wearing catch wrestling, sh- wearing wrestling shoes. And I remember I was talking to some of my friends about this, and they say, "Oh yeah, Josh Barnett, his jujitsu is so good, and he's wearing jujitsu shoes." And I was jiu-jitsu just like, shoes. "I was just like, <laughs> I'm staring at them." Like, he's wearing a jujitsu speedo as well. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, uh, "No, it's catch wrestling." But they're like, "You mean wrestling or what? Like, is it or?" Submission wrestling. I was like, it's called catch wrestling. <laughs> yeah, for those not familiar with catch wrestling or catch as catch can, it's a martial art that originated in Lancashire, England. It was also called Lancashire wrestling. Essentially, catch as catch can means catch whatever part of the body you can and break it however you can. That's it's where, that's where term no holds barred comes from. Yes, right? no holds barred. A lot of terms in the English language come from catch wrestling. For example, say uncle when you pick on your little brother. For example, that's how you tap out. If you will, in catch wrestling, you you say uncle literally. It's a form of submission. Um, what else? No holds barred. Yes, that means all all submission techniques are legal, mm-hmm. and they don't call them submissions in catch wrestling. They're called holds, hooks, stretches, and and, and there's so many so many different vocabulary terms mm-hmm. uh, in catch wrestling. For example, in jujitsu, they'll call a a choke a guillotine from the front in catch wrestling they'll call the same choke a gag for example mm-hmm. or like and, kimura and double wrist lock yeah, yeah or the hammer lock yeah or the guard the, the body scissors or the saturday night ride that, that's that's a real term i'm not making that up <laughs> gonna but, saturday night ride you okay, careful <laughs> indeed yeah and there's there's a lot of rides in, in catch wrestling which are are very much not really not really taught at all in jiu-jitsu, like the side ride and, and so on, which is, it's a very powerful control position when, when used correctly, and I think it translates perfectly into mixed martial arts. Because mm-hmm. um, sure. the thing about that is that catch wrestling gives you either win by submission or pin, and you never want to be on your back. You always want to, uh, as, soon as, you're, as soon as you're on your back, you got to roll out of it. You got to get up. and uh, Unpin uh, those shoulders. Right, right. Because I started off from jiu-jitsu first, and I remember uh, I met a, uh, I met a catch wrestler a couple uh, years ago, and this is just briefly. And he and he always told me, "Don't think sport, think street." And not to offend jujitsu guys, but he but he said, "Jujitsu is, is kind of like too much of a sport because the fact that you're always on your back." But he says, if you look at it from a street perspective, that's actually the worst case scenario. Because look at MMA. As soon as you're on your back, you just get punched in the face. 
So whereas catch wrestling, it always teaches you to go, like, get off your back, just get up, and... It's the be the, the yeah, guy on top up. mentality. Yeah, yeah. It's the top player mentality, which, again, translates so much better for mixed martial arts, in my opinion. And the street, as well, because you never want to be on your back on the street. Just get up as fast as possible. Yeah, I mean... In I, my opinion. Yeah. I've spent a, a great deal of time working on the guard. I've, I've got a... I've, I've, I'd like to say I have a pretty dangerous guard. I've won fights from the guard and all that, but I'm going to tell you straight up, it's better to be the guy on top. And catch wrestling, it's it's a much more high energy sport than jujitsu because there's no resting point. Mm-hmm. You can never rest in the guard. You can never there, there's no stopping point because right. as soon as you stop, you're you're dead essentially. Yeah, exactly. Like in jujitsu, from bottom side control, you can chill there, whereas wrestling or catch wrestling, you can't because that's a pin. So you gotta always keep moving. Yeah, there's there's quite literally no way to fight lazy in catch wrestling. Whereas in jujitsu, yeah, you you can be a little bit lazy about it. Mm-hmm. And also, and, oh no, yeah. sorry, go on. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say also, jujitsu has too many rules. Like you can't do this, you can't do that. Whereas catch wrestling doesn't. Because I've noticed there are a lot of techniques that I've that I learned from Singapore. Because I think I told you I went to a catch wrestling gym in Singapore. Yeah. And also, uh, from YouTube. And I remember when I was at Shanghai BAJ, I was just trying it out, and a lot of them were like. Like it, was, it was like a calf slicer or things or a bicep uh. slicer, things like that, neck crank. A lot of them, a, lot, a good example is the, is the can opener from the, from the close guard. Okay. I know a lot of people don't like that because the fact that you're extending your arms, it could lead to an arm bar. But I mean, obviously, if you're, if you're aware of that and you know and, and you're looking out for it, it can be effective. Because I know GSP does that a lot, the can opener. And he always punches. Yeah. But I know uh, like, even when I did a can opener, the easiest, to, it's actually quite easy to escape. You just got to unlock your guard yeah, open and then up just legs. sit up. But a lot of them didn't know that. And they were like, what kind of cr- submission was that? I was like, oh, it's called a can opener. So uh, man, and, We used to do can openers all the time when, when I started training. Um, used to train at this basement gym back in, back in Utah with, uh, with my old coach Shane Brenner. And I remember one day um, some guys were rolling, a dude's putting a can opener on the other da- guy trying to open up his guard, get him to open up those legs to try a submission or something. And the guy taps out and Shane's like, we don't tap out to can openers in this gym. What are you doing, man? Just change your position. Yeah, anyway, I guess I guess because um, yeah, like like when you don't when you don't know something or when you don't know how to the, the the escape for it, you eventually just tap. But then once you realize it's actually quite easy, then uh, then that's why. But I mean, like that's the thing. You either win or you learn. So you learn from that experience. Like the buggy choke is like, is like the <laughs> buggy choke. Oh man. Jordan is an interesting guy to train with because he's always coming in with these uh, these crazy unorthodox things he saw on YouTube and and uh, he's like hey hey let me test out this buggy chuck I'm like the the buggy what <laughs> it's the stupidest sounding thing and it's it's the goofiest looking thing and like Jordan that that's never gonna work that's that's garbage <laughs> don't even try that and then next thing I know he's like catching some people and tapping some people out with the buggy choke of all things I'm like um okay thanks for proving me wrong there. <laughs> I actually, I actually heard it's actually quite easy to escape it. So, <laughs> but if you think about it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Well, I'll just I'll just say it, and then uh, I heard like um, because basically from side control. Uh, all, well, let's say I'm I'm on top side control. Someone tries to buddy choke me. All you gotta do is just cross face and then just posture up. Yeah. And I heard I heard that was it, and I never tried it, but it does make sense. So I said okay. But when you, when you realize that, you're like, oh, it is quite easy. Yeah, a lot of these uh, these crazy moves have crazy simple solutions to them as well. Mm-hmm. But if if you've never been exposed to them, yeah, you 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 wouldn't know. But yeah, catch wrestling. It's like um, everything that is illegal and evil and wrong and bad in jujitsu is is the bread and butter of catch wrestling, essentially. So it's mm-hmm. all about the leg locks and the neck cranks and the neck and spinal cranks and yeah, for and. Sure. Yeah. And and catch wrestling because I, I read quite a few books about catch wrestling and I was I was wondering you know why is catch wrestling disappearing or why is it not as popular and I read it's because um and correct me if I'm wrong but it's because uh it it I remember it was for entertainment purposes like Billy Robinson or like Frank Gotch they were doing yeah. they were doing it was it like at a carnival or was it for a show and they thought that it was boring to see people uh, the audience thought it was boring. 
to see guys rolling on the ground. Yeah, real wrestling is, it's not the most spectator-friendly sport. And so catch wrestling, catch as catch, can started to evolve into what we now know as pro wrestling that we saw in the WWF and today see in the WWE. Right, exactly. In fact, yeah. they still use catch as catch can rules technically in the uh, WWE. You win by pin or by submission. Mm -hmm. It's just that for WWE, it's it's a show. They, yeah. they need to entertain the audience. It's not fake. It's <laughs> scripted. There's a big difference. <laughs> and and that that's why that's how it ended up losing its um it's uh well it almost died. It became its it's like almost extinct. Yeah. And then but that's why you have like um other catch wrestlers like Josh Barnett or uh you know Snake Snake Pit, uh Joel Bain, yeah. Curran Jacobs, who Johnny Buck, those those guys. I don't know if you know who they are, but uh yeah, they're they're trying to keep the sport alive. And there's actually a big uh event coming up soon, which is Curran Jacobs versus Gordon Ryan. Oh yeah, yeah. Heard yeah. about that. You 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 sent me some info about that. Yeah. Cuz uh, cuz uh Curran Jacobs, I I follow him on Facebook. He's the catch wrestler. Yeah, he's a world catch wrestling uh the world catch wrestling champion. And uh, I know I think Gordon Ryan, he called out the wrestlers or something like and that. He's the jujitsu guy, Gordon Ryan. Yeah, yeah. He's a black belt, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's black belt and uh and he's really good. I've seen his videos and he's and um I something about like he called out wrestlers and then Curran uh accepted his challenge. And there's a lot of beef going on. Yeah. <laughs> like a lot of trash talking going on. So I really hope it does happen because this cause this is something that the world needs to see. Because Gordon Ryan's really famous. He has like his own fan base. And if he you know, he goes against a catch wrestler, hopefully it can make catch wrestling popular again. But I remember I was talking to my other friend about this. He says, Well, I don't know, because look at Josh Barnett and Dean Lister. Did catch wrestling become popular after that? Not really. Yeah, I think it just cemented in the minds of people who already loved catch wrestling. This is cool. And jujitsu guys were meanwhile thinking, well, uh, that, that's just that one guy because he's a, he's a beast. Yeah, yeah. And I know some people also said, like, Josh Barnett was heavier than Dean Lister, so it was unfair or things like that. So they're trying to, like, uh, justify his win. And, and you know, it, it is sad to see that, but let's say Curran does defeat Gordon Ryan. I'm... You know, I'm because Curran he does a lot for the the catch wrestling community. So I know he will push really hard to to make catch wrestling like more international. I know Snake Pit actually just opened a, a gym in Niagara Falls, Canada, yeah. and 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 which got me excited because I live quite close to Niagara Falls. So I'm like, oh crap, I want to go there, and check it out. You, you know what catch wrestling could do to become more popular, which is. What what I, what they actually did in Japan because after um, catch wrestling was essentially reduced to a carnival sideshow in the United States back in the the 1800s early 1900s, uh, catch wrestlers started going to Japan to teach the art over there, which um, became known as shoot fighting or shuto, and so there are a lot of uh, Japanese wrestlers today who actually come from a catch wrestling tradition like um, Kurosawa. Yeah, uh, Kazushi Sakuraba and and um, yeah, Sakuraba. I yeah, think. Kurosawa. A, a bunch of these other guys, Antonio Inoki. Um, yeah, just ton, tons of guys, names I can't even pronounce. But uh, yeah, it um, it became firmly cemented over there. But China, I know jujitsu has a decent foot in the door in China right now, mm -hmm. but it's still an extremely niche sport. Yeah, yeah, or a Muay Thai. As well, like it's getting more pop. Yeah, I guess it's getting more popular. And there's here. there's no high level jujitsu here. There are a uh, couple of black belts. There are a small handful of black belts yeah. here, and I wouldn't say any of them are like top level on the world stage mm -hmm. or anything like that. So, man, there Eunice. Eunice is really good. I know yeah, he was, he's, he's he was world champion at Abu Dhabi, I think, like yeah. two years ago, last year. Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I know Stan is good as well, like the others. But again, there's not that many. Black yeah, we, we don't have any like Rodolfo Vieiras or yeah or, Eddie Bravo <laughs> type of things, right? Whereas um, in Canada, or United States, uh, I'm not sure about Australia or England, but Canada, United States, there's jiu jitsu gyms everywhere. It's like oh, there's one, oh, yeah. there's one. There's so man, one. if catch wrestling really wanted to become more popular, man, come over to China, set up some gyms, set up some challenge matches, 
beat up all these uh, <laughs> substandard jujitsu guys and and be like, yeah, catch wrestling's the best because that's essentially what uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu did. They came to the United States where nobody had any clue what Jiu Jitsu was, and you know, beat up a bunch of guys who didn't know how to grapple. And everybody was like, well, obviously that's the best martial art. There was a video of that too, wasn't there? And he was challenging like karate guys or yeah. Kung Fu. Okay, yeah. I and think then I've that, that transitioned into the UFC. Right. I mean, essentially, the same thing could still happen in China. Somebody make it happen. Uh-huh. But the, the, and the thing about that is that, like, um, because I remember the, the teacher from Singapore I was talking to, and um, he's a catch he's a catch wrestling teacher. Excuse me. And uh, he wanted to op- he kind of wanted to open like a, a catch wrestling or like a mini like open up like a, a gym here in China. Yeah. But I remember he's, it was a bit difficult because when you say catch wrestlers to Chinese people or to jujitsu people, they don't know what that is. They're like, yeah. what? What is that? It's like, why should I pay for that? Whereas, and, but he doesn't want to falsely advertise it as like jujitsu, but when you go in there, it's catch wrestling. I just right? tell him it's, it's like jujitsu, but better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think was I think was striking though like Muay Thai. I think Sanda is still the most popular one here. Yeah, Sanda, which is Chinese kickboxing. It's like kickboxing yeah. with throws and takedowns. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, I think most of the Chinese fighters who go to MMA or go to yeah MMA like who are fighting in the UFC, I think they started from Sanda. Yeah, and most of them come from the Xi'an Sports University. Weirdly, that's like the um, the university. Uh, Sports universities in China, they're, they're these big athletic centers where, where people often start training as children for very specific sports, and, and they'll often like uh, feed into the Olympic teams and things like that. And the Xi'an Sports University is probably the biggest one for combat sports. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where the China top team started. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, oh, I was going to say something. What was I going to say about Chinese? Oh, yeah, because... Because there's a lot of like foreigners, uh, particularly Americans, who come to China to do to do MMA fighting. Like Kyle is another good example. Yeah. It's a good example. And I remember I was talking to some of them, and they always told me because I was asked like, "What's the diff? Like, do you notice any difference fighting Chinese opponents versus American opponents or like Western?" And they yeah. always told me Chinese uh, MMA fighters they have better striking than American than uh, let's say American. MMA fighters, but it's just that American MMA fighters have better grappling, like better wrestling. And I can understand why, because wrestling is so very, it's very popular in the United States. Like they start like call, like high school level. Yeah, whereas Often before. Right, right. Yeah. And whereas China, wrestling, you know, it's not really common, even like jujitsu. Like they don't teach wrestling in like high school here, but like yeah. Sanda is more known here. And there are Sanda schools. For like high school students, so yeah. so I thought. I mean, because you fought here professionally, yeah. And do you agree with that? Too? Yeah, definitely. That was um, the the striking level in mixed martial arts in China when I started fighting here. Again, I was fighting people who basically came from a pure Sanda background. Uh, didn't have very many ground fighting skills, so you know, if if I could get these guys on the ground, it wasn't. It was like fighting fish out of water. But the stand up game, yeah. Some of these guys are just absolute killers. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and, and yeah, sort of. Oops, damn it! Talking while I do Wing Chun. <laughs> uh, and I just lost my way of thinking. That's okay. Let's let's talk about crazy movies, for example, because I know you're a big aficionado of uh, of old martial arts movies. Okay, and, yeah. And I just saw I just saw this one that blew my mind: Revenge of the Ninja. I've never I've heard of that. I've just never seen it before. Oh man! So I was I was watching. Um, it, it's like Chinese Netflix. It's a it's this. Um, what do they call it? The Xiaomi something or other. Anyway, it's like Chinese Netflix. I was watching. Oh, with Xiaomi. My, yeah, yeah, with my wife the other day. You can just like get movies on demand or whatever. And my wife is on this '80s nostalgia kick, so she wanted to see Revenge of the Nerds. And so we click on that, but for some reason they had uploaded Revenge of the Ninja instead of Revenge of the Nerds. And so we start watching it like, this is different than I remember. There are a lot more ninjas in Revenge of the Nerds. And I, I hadn't seen it since, since the 80s. So, so I was like, was this like a prologue? I, I don't remember because... Uh, anyway, so <laughs> it is the most, the most unintentionally hilarious martial arts film I have ever seen, or at least in a very long time. Oh man, it's. It, well, it what was a, it made? 
I think it was made in 1981, maybe 83, early 80s. Okay. So this uh, this Japanese guy, he's. it starts with his family being assassinated by ninjas, and then this American businessman's like, come to America with me and open up a gallery and display your Japanese dolls, because he's like collects dolls and is a nin- ninja as well. So he moves to America and raises his son, who is, they're like the sole survivors of the family who got assassinated by ninjas. And then it turns out the American businessman posing as his friend was also secretly a ninja who goes out dressing up like a ninja assassinating people in the U.S. in broad daylight. Was it Ashida Kim? Was it that guy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Um, no, but I'm pretty sure he inspired Ashida Kim to some degree. <laughs> For those of you who don't know who Ashira Kim is, you can YouTube, you can YouTube him. <laughs> oh man, uh, there are so yeah, and <laughs> ninjas are amazing. And then the thing about that guy is that he takes it so seriously. Like there was a video I saw where it's like um how to break into someone's house and just, and you stick on the wall like this, <laughs> like that. It's like really like no one's gonna notice you. <laughs> and he's wearing all black too, and the wall is white. It's like it's so <laughs> visible. You know, that, that all-black ninja costume, something I learned um, recently, actually, it started out in kabuki theater, a traditional Japanese form of theater, where they would have a bunch of stagehands wearing all-black who were supposed to be basically invisible, uh, kind, kind of like um, in modern-day green screen um, film, where they, they, they like um, digitally edit out the guys in the background who are moving props around, or, or um, you put CGI over the top of them. Uh, they'll wear like green suits or whatever. Anyway, in Kabuki theater, they would have these stagehands wear all black uh, and be all covered up in black. So the audience would essentially be trained to to filter them out. Think these guys are invisible. They're not really there. They're just moving props around. They're moving actors around, making them look like they fly or whatever. And uh, a few hundred years, I don't remember how many, a significant amount of time after the whole uh, legend of the ninja uh, became popular, um, a a playwright wrote a play about a ninja and to display the ninja's power of invisibility he had him dress in this, uh, this stagehand black costume to show the audience this guy is literally invisible he can disappear and so that, that became so popular of an idea that we just started associating ninjas with the black kabuki stagehand invisibility costume which is still the uh, the one we see in the movies and everything else today. That's where they get their. That, that, uh, that's how the stereotype, or that's how the the idea that they can disappear like that. Yeah, it's probably started. Exactly. Now you see me. Now you don't. It's like that. Visual. That, that's a special effects. The power of editing. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. But going back to like um those like movies and like kung fu movies. Uh, I was telling you about this earlier, because um I know it's like back in. 2000 or like mid 90s up until 2000 kung fu movies were very popular like jackie chan jet lee there was movies like romeo must die rumble in the bronx those type of movies and you know i noticed like in hollywood well in hollywood at least i I don't know about chinese and in china but in hollywood and then eventually they started to fade out yeah and i was just like okay that's kind of strange to see and i was talking to my friend about this who's also a movie buff he was saying well because you know there's always a there's always um a trend for certain for, for certain movies like people love kung fu movies then and it died out and then uh, people love like right now the trend is comic book movies yeah and the question is like how long would it last because i know some people who are getting bored of it because they're saying there's it's just so many out there but i know marvel I'm, i think they said that they were gonna make 20 more comic book movies or something like that and like because with the uh, the final avengers they're gonna kind of. They're not gonna reboot it, but they're gonna have like new characters yeah. after this one finishes. Because I think like Robert Downey Jr. and Chris Evans they said that they weren't gonna do anymore. So and, and there's like rumor. And now that Disney bought 20th Century, 20th Century Fox, who does X Men, Fantastic Four, yeah, they're saying things like. And oh, that that would be consistent with the comics because yeah, the Avengers yeah. is always changing their their roster yeah. in the comics. Yeah, but um, but I think because Hollywood's a business and you gotta make. Money. Yeah, that, that is interesting looking back at the, the history of what was popular as far as genre. I mean, for the longest time, Westerns were the big money maker in Hollywood. And now, I mean, it's just like a couple of Westerns get made every year coming out of Hollywood, 
which, uh, I mean, if you, if you visit like the Universal Studios lot and look around, they, they still have the sets to make westerns and all that, but they're, they're just not put to use like they used to be. I, th- I think the last big blockbuster but, uh, western movie was Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained. I think that was the last one. And the other westerns are just more like independent. Because, I, again, I, I have Xiaomi Box 2, which is like the Chinese Netflix. And I know it's, oh, this western movie looks interesting. And I look at the year, it's like 2018 or 2017. But I've yeah. never heard of it before, so I think that they're more. I think Western now are going more independent route. Yeah, man. My mom loved Western Western films, man. It, it's kind of funny in China if you say Western film, they think you're talking about like any American or European film because Western means something way different in China. It just means essentially um, not Chinese foreigner. <laughs> yeah, actually, just recently I saw the movie The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. I finally saw it. Oh yeah. <laughs> And I, Clint Eastwood. Yeah, yeah, and I and I still I, I still enjoy it even to this day, like a movie from that long ago. Like it wasn't cheesy to me. It was the soundtrack was very good. I thought it was very well made. Yeah, those are classics, man. Mm-hmm. It's not like Revenge of the Ninja, where uh, <laughs> thirty years later it's it's unintentionally hilarious. But man, if I saw that as a kid, I would have been stoked. I would be like, yeah, they're kicking and punching and ninjas and ninja stars. Yeah, <laughs> I think back then. If, if, if the movie, like, if, if this was, like, the 80s and we saw it then, it would probably be awesome. But looking yeah. back at it, it's kind of, like, laughable. Yeah, they made, they made three sequels. I mean, it was a trilogy. Oh, uh, Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, and then Ninja 3. They got a little less creative on the, the third part. How are the fight scenes? Um, the fight scenes are... How can I put this? So, some of them are just laughably hilarious, but then there are a few very lucid moments of, oh, wow, that was kind of a cool move there. I wonder if that would work. And then they do something stupid again. They're like, ah. So. I mean, yeah, there are some moves that you can learn from movie, I guess. I mean, you said you learned a move from Tekken. Yeah. The arm bar. Tekken 4. There, there's this crazy rolling arm bar, and I just took out the roll, and it works perfectly, set, setting up an arm bar from sprawl control. But and yeah, pick that one up from a video game of all places. Was it from Sprawl or was it from Turtle Position? Um, sprawl Control. Oh, Sprawl Control, okay. okay. Yeah, so again, if you see moves on video on YouTube, yeah, feel free to try it. But you know, make sure to check if it's legit. They'll just yeah. say, okay, that's real. I'm going to do it. And do this. And it doesn't work. And even if it is a legit move, you've got to put in the hours. You've got to log the hours trying this against different levels of resistance until you can finally pull it off against a fully resisting opponent. As Bruce Lee said, you know, like, he fears a man who, who sorry, he does not fear the man who, who made a thousand kicks. But he, uh, oh, crap, I can't even think of I that. I fear not <laughs> the man who, who knows a thousand kicks. I fear the man who... Knows when one kick and has practiced a thousand times. Yeah. So he said, "Yeah, yeah." If you want to get good at kicking, make Bruce Lee afraid of you. Practice a kick way more than a thousand times, man. Or like submissions or anything. So yeah, I mean, because uh, I remember I, I think I was, I, was, I was talking to Eunice about this, my coach. This is back when I was training, yeah. and he always told me like uh, when he was teaching class. Oh yeah, like don't. Don't say that, like, I don't want to see no moves from YouTube and say, or you say you learned it from YouTube. <laughs> o- only show it unless you know it works. Because uh, I mean, he was telling me too many people were saying, oh, I learned this from YouTube. I learned this from YouTube. And he's like, okay, first of all, don't do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> so. Oh, man. That was kind of the opposite of my first martial arts experience. I um, had this Taekwondo coach um, back when I was 17. Um, my freshman year of college, started college a little early. And every time we would spar, he would say, all right, you can do any of the moves we learned in class or anything you've seen in the movies. Go. And we'd all look around like, is he serious? Like anything we've seen in the movies. And so some of us would goof around and start trying to emulate, I don't know, kung fu films and look ridiculous. And we, But we figured out what worked and what didn't. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's what training is for. I mean, you test your techniques and if they work, good fine. If they don't work, you ask why okay, why didn't it work? Is it just useless or did I not do something right? So that's what the purpose of training yeah. is for. It's, it's just like um, the Tai Chi versus MMA thing going on. Because it was Xu Xiaodong. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but um, there's been a lot of debate, uh, or con- well, debate or controversy going on between how effective Tai Chi is in um, an actual um, full contact uh, fight in full contact sport, and so that's when that sh- guy from Beijing, Xu Xiaodong, yeah, 
uh, he challenged the tai, the tai Chi guy, or was it the other way around? Anyways, they fought and he won like 15 seconds or something like that. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so, and a lot of Tai, and there's also like Tai Chi guys challenging BJJ guys too. There was a video about that. Interesting. Uh, it happened, I think, Shenzhen or Shenyang. It was a, a, I posted a video there on the group actually where a Tai Chi guy was trying to go against his B, against a jujitsu guy and then he got armbarred and he was complaining about it. <laughs> and, 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 you know, people are still saying, oh, it's because the jiu-jitsu guy was stronger or things like that. And I was just like, well, I mean, Tai Chi is not a grappling or it's not, or it's not meant for, well, his Tai Chi at least is not meant for fighting like that. The thing right? is, Tai Chi, it actually is a grappling art, but most people don't know that. See, oh. most, most people who practice Tai Chi have no idea what it's for. I mean, they're just doing forms all day. And, uh, I mean, the overwhelming majority of Tai Chi practitioners do not train how to fight. And so they simply don't know how to fight. Oh, oh, okay, like the pushing hands, you mean? Kind of like that? Like, Well, I mean, they're, you know, I, 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 had, I had the chance to train with a, a Tai Chi master, a guy who actually knew how to fight. Um, and and this guy was just a, a master of joint locks and throws and, and, and all kinds of grappling techniques. I mean, there, were, there was no punching, no kicking, no striking. It was all grappling, standing grappling. And that shocked me because every like video game I played where there's like a Tai Chi fighter, it's all like Kung Fu striking and whatever. And, and that wasn't it at all. And I always hear these people on the internet saying, Tai Chi is actually a deadly killing system with strikes and what. Okay, whatever. The five palm heart exploding technique. Whatever. That, that's how I know you don't know how to. That's how I know you have never been in a fight before, to be honest. Sorry. Sorry to offend, but not sorry. Um. But yeah, this, this guy knew how to grapple. Now, um, it's not ground fighting at all, but yeah, it's, it's joint locks and it's throws and it's weight manipulation and all this stuff. But uh, yeah, we've got like 1.3 billion people in China. At least half of them are doing Tai Chi forms out there in the morning every day. And most of those people have never been in a fight in their lives and, and have never trained the practical application of those forms. That's Oh, okay. yeah, I remember you told me that, about that. Yeah, so, so that guy, yeah, and he, I remember he was really strong. He was like yeah. throwing you. You think he would do good against a jiu-jitsu guy now? In the stand-up phase of a fight, yeah, definitely. Okay. I mean, if they're rolling on the floor, yeah, I think he'd be a fish out of water, but mm -hmm. yeah, because, the, yeah. again, we, we excel at what we train at. That's exactly. It. Exactly, yeah. And uh, so going back uh, going back to like a Tai Chi and MMA thing, um, so, so, so as you said, yeah, it's, it, it's good for like stand-up, maybe like wrestling type, but not for like striking. He was yeah. Saying, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, because they're two different ball games. I mean, it's like putting, it's like telling Lo Floyd May, excuse me, Floyd Mayweather, to do a jujitsu match with Eddie Bravo and only use grappling rules. <laughs> like obviously he's gonna lose. But if you do the opposite, you know, Eddie Bravo does a boxing with Floyd Mayweather, you know, then he'll win. So it's like different. Diff like like different areas of expertise. Yeah. So you, you can't really say like MMA versus Tai Chi type of thing. But that a lot of Tai Chi guys they saying oh it's so there's just one guy specifically I forgot his name but he, he was a guy that challenged Xu Xiaodong and then that's when the police came. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard about that. They they uh, came to to stop the fight. Yeah, they came to stop the fight. It's that guy in particular who uh, and his student was the one who challenged the BJJ guy who got tapped out. And I remember I was watching a video of him, and he was saying how, oh yeah, Tai Chi is just so good because it's so strong. Uh, the the guy that the Tai Chi guy that Xu Xiaodong fought, he doesn't know much about fighting. That's why he lost, uh, or he just start finding ways excuses. And but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of controversies now going on. Thing, yeah. 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 Tai Chi is a weird martial art because uh, essentially, and I'll, I'm probably going to offend a lot of people when I say this, essentially it's, it's a form of Chinese folk wrestling. And it's been passed on with forms because, again, you can't, you know, hundreds of years ago they couldn't take videos or pictures or even write books because they were, you know, people were generally Ill illiterate back then. Uh, and so they made a form to pass on this information. And in the modern era, people forget the application of the form and they just do the form and it looks like, I don't know, it looks like you're, you're trying to be a wizard and throw invisible fireballs out of your fingers or something when in reality it's like grabbing a leg and sweeping it or something. 
Yeah, and the sound so, effects too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there's there's also a linguistic misunderstanding. Like a lot of uh, uh, non-Chinese people, they hear Tai Chi and they think, oh, Chi, that's like that mystical energy. And it's it's not even the same character or the same meaning. Like Ji in Mandarin, it's, um, what, what is that? It's like, um, it's, like uh, it's Ji, not, not Chi. So it's, it's a different character. Chi is like breath or air uh-huh. or, or sometimes it's misunderstood kind of energy, to be kind of energy, energy or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but G, the the Mandarin form in, in Cantonese, it's it's transliterated as as Qi, which is not the same as as the Qi you're probably thinking of, you know, that breath energy sort of thing. And so people uh, misunderstand it to be like this magical power kind of thing. It would be like if um, three hundred years from now, um, people practiced <coughs> collegiate wrestling except they didn't remember how to wrestle and they just like made a form out of it and they were out there like saying oh yes this is an ancient martial art where where um and, and they're all like wearing unitards or what, what do we, they call those uh singlets they're all wearing sp- singlets and, and like doing these forms and talking about how we're harnessing our mystical energy so that we can throw fireballs and disrupt the other guy's chi or whatever and the no touch ko because nobody remembers <laughs> what wrestling looks like I mean that that's basically what happened to Tai Chi. Uh-huh. And and Tai Chi is I mean it is good for the health and the mind like the the breathing exercises they do. So I so I don't deny that, right? It is good for that cuz I do know um someone back in Canada, he uh he did I don't he, he, he did he was a black belt karate, but a lot of the breathing exercises he did, I remember he was telling me it's a lot of the Tai Chi stuff, like all the like the hard breathing work uh exercises and he told me at that time he had bronchitis yeah. but after doing all that tai chi breathing exercise it cured it so and he was actually surprised uh because he thought it was all a myth but he said it works so he said um so again you know tai chi is good for that but is it good for like punching he's like not I, like i don't think so yeah well, not not the Tai Chi that I know. Yeah, it is really oh, interesting. Goodness. The going through those forms in that very slow, methodical, uh, deliberate fashion is actually really good for your joints. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like as you said, uh, like not just Tai Chi, like karate, like the forms as well. Like this, for example, that like the the knife attack. It's not meant to like strike, but it's more. To, it's like an arm drag. Yeah. Type of thing. So it's just like Wing Chun because there are applications of Wing Chun, right? Like this, and uh, there's a reason why they do that it's not because for the hell of it right it's just just there's actual reasons but a lot of people don't know why yeah so, uh, either they forgot or they just and don't that, explain it that spear hand like this from taekwondo and shotokan karate forms i've heard so many instructors say well back in the old days they used to harden up their fingertips so you could <laughs> impale somebody through the guts and tear out their intestines i'm like well what's the other hand for why are you doing this balance <laughs> Balance, yes. It's like Mortal Kombat. It's like dun dun dun. Kano. I still uh, remember. The, uh, down the up, select, 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 strike AB. Man, a... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, um, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, because so like like there's a vi- there's a YouTube video of it where like famous UFC fighters and then, like Lyoto Machida and like other people, it like they'll show the karate form and then they'll show they're actually using it in in their fights. So they are effective. It's just that you got to like really drill it, train it hard, know when to use it, know how to yeah, use it. And you've got to know the function, not just the form. Oh that's, yeah. That's that thing that gets lost so much in traditional martial arts because, you know, anciently it was so important to remember that form exactly as it was because again, there were no books, there were no pictures, no videos. So the form was the fount of information, but modern traditional martial arts, have become so fixated on preserving the form that they've forgotten the function. That's a good point. And also, like, everybody, I'm sure, like, as it passed on, they, some, like, some other student must have changed it. Oh, instead of this, I'll do this instead <laughs> or something. And then oh, yeah. you teach it to that student, and then it becomes, like, some no-touch. I mean, that's probably how no-touch KO masters came from. <laughs> or something. George Dillman, we're looking at you, man. Uh or there are so many out there. <laughs> I, I know, man. I, I remember I mentioned George Dillman once in one of my videos, and, and a guy in the comments got really angry. And he said, Rams, you don't understand real martial arts. George Dillman is a genius. And, and I thought at first, this guy's trolling me. But uh, 
I kept reading and I realized, no, he's he's dead serious. This guy really believes in in George Dillman and the the no touch knockout. And they think they debunked it. I remember they interviewed him, and then some they tried to do that to some guy, to some interviewer, and he's like, no, it doesn't work. And he said something uh, about like, oh, it's your toe. <laughs> if, if you cross your toes or stick your tongue in a certain place in your mouth, it negates it. And then they went to a jujitsu school, and he tries it on like a jujitsu blue belt, and. And he's like, yeah, I don't feel anything. And George Dillman, he's like, uh, well, it doesn't work on trained athletes. <laughs> and then he tries out on another guy, and he's like, well, it, he's a non-believer. So <laughs> doesn't work on non-believers, trained athletes, or people crossing their toes or having their tongue on the roof of their mouth. So, so that's the offense to that. Just go. Clearly a deadly <laughs> street self-defense art. Yeah, so it won't, in other words, it won't work in the streets. <laughs> Oh, man. Why do we always say the streets when talking about uh, about um, altercations that happen outside of a outside of a gym? I mean, do people really fight on the road? Uh, from the videos that I I, I sent, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess it does happen. It does happen, but 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 I understand what you're saying. Like, um, because a lot of the, sh- the self defense videos it says, oh, if you're walking down an alleyway all by yourself with a billion dollars of cash with you. You know what I mean? It's like, really? Like, are you really gonna do that? Oh man, especially especially in like modern Shanghai, where man, so much of this culture has gone cashless. Oh yeah, it's everything is being paid, or not just Shanghai, but China. Everything's being paid in WeChat or or Alipay. I mean, you can, you can still use cash, but um, man, you they'll, you can they'll look digitally funny. transfer funds for almost anything now. It's actually quite hard to pay by cash because I remember I did that one time, and this is before I started using Alipay. And I remember I, wa- I was buying lunch, and I I gave them my cash, and they're like, "Oh, do you have um like WeChat or Alipay?" I said, "No." He says, well, "We don't have change for that much," and it was only uh, like I, I was only looking for like twenty RMB change, right? <laughs> Which is probably like three dollars can- American. <laughs> I was like, you don't have change for like three dollars American, so I actually had to go. I actually had to like go to another restaurant where they did have change, and that's when finally I used Ali AliPay, and it's just so much convenient. It's just beep 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 beep. Yeah, for people outside of China who don't know what WeChat and AliPay are, they're basically some of the largest businesses worldwide. The thing about China, since it has the biggest population in the world, pretty much they have the world records for the largest everything in the world. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's it's like Chinese social media plus everything else that you need to do digitally with a phone to interact with other human beings, uh, commerce, um, and you can pay bills. Yeah, do, you, you could do you do your banking on a phone. Yeah, through like the, through this one app. So it's yeah. like it's like Facebook Messenger, uh, phone video conferencing. Um, I d- I do know that um. They're trying, I don't know, like Jack Ma, the, the founder of Alibaba, he's trying to make Alipay famous or popular in the United States and Canada because there's a uh, lot of Chinese people there as well as tourists that go there. Yeah, and Alipay, Alibaba, it's it's uh, online banking and Alibaba is, um, what is that? It's like the like Amazon. Uh, it's kind of, kind of like Amazon like or, or China, you can buy Amazon. things in bulk as well. Yeah, and that's funny because, you know, some things in... Uh, I remember when I was a headhunter, I was talking to... Because I fo- when I was a headhunter, I used to work in the IT... Uh, department and so I spoke to a lot of IT guys and th- I was talking to this one guy and he said and he was telling me well one reason why Facebook YouTube Twitter is banned in China not because they can't control it the government can't control it but it's to kick out competitors because yeah. Chinese people if Facebook YouTube was allowed then everybody would be using that instead of the Chinese Facebook the Chinese YouTube right so in order for the Chinese government to protect its own market they kick out the competitors. Yeah. And, you know, they're not the only country that does that. I mean, if, if you're not familiar with um, with the internet in China, a lot of foreigners get endlessly frustrated with the internet here because so many popular American Western websites are, are banned. There's what we call the Great Firewall of China over the whole country. So, um, yeah. To, shield. Yes. To access Facebook or YouTube, you have to use a virtual private network. A VPN, and you gotta pay for it. Yeah, we we should totally get sponsored by some virtual private network out there. If anybody's <laughs> listening, virtual private networks are a big thing in China. ExpressVPN for expats. ExpressVPN, <laughs> not officially sponsored by ExpressVPN. 
Uh, yeah, because yeah, uh, uh, I remember back in Canada, a lot of people always tell me, oh, yeah, Facebook is banned. I said, yeah, but I got a VPN. And they say, you got to pay for it. And they're like, you got to pay to use to get on Facebook. But even though it's not that expensive, but st- yeah. but still, I mean, I, like, fa- like not having Facebook is one thing, but not having YouTube. I need YouTube. Because yeah. <laughs> YouTube, I do everything. I, I, like, I learn how to cook on YouTube. How to cook chicken? <laughs> oh man, there's there's so many great rice. tutorials on YouTube. I mean, there, there's there's tons of garbage, but man, if I if I want to learn how to use a a uh, computer application or or program something or or figure out how to hook up some audio visual thing that I'm not familiar with, just look that up on YouTube, and yeah. it's it's there. Yeah, YouTube's YouTube is great, and apparently they're starting to create TV shows now, like YouTube Red, like oh, that yeah. Koba, Koba Kai, which was awesome. Yeah, I actually did like it. It was. It surprised me. <laughs> so I, I like how they made Ralph Macchiato the like the villain of it. Yeah. Because I thought that it was going to be about him and like his family, but it wasn't. It was about the other guy. Yeah, Johnny Lawrence's perspective. Uh-huh. And they brought like the old characters back, so which was pretty. Was yeah. Pretty so good. something I was I was hoping they would answer, which they did not. Mild spoiler, not really, not really. It's just what wasn't in the show was. Um, Answering the question, did the next Karate Kid happen in the same fictional universe as the original Karate Kid trilogy, or was that a tangent what if sort of situation? Is that the one with Hillary Swank? The one with Hillary Swank, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't remember if I've seen that one actually. I haven't seen it for a long time, but as I remember, the plot was basically Hillary Swank goes to school and she gets bullied by this group of evil Nazi like hall monitors, and she learns karate from Mr. Miyagi and then goes and fights the the evil Nazi-like hall monitors and then like the Hitler of hall monitors essentially attempts to murder her and <laughs> that's about all I remember but uh yeah that was a strange film for a lot of reasons usually usually sequels and trilogies don't really work I mean <coughs> I mean it's very rare to have like a sequel better than a first the only ones I can think of are like very like very few maybe like Empire Strikes Back yeah. or X2, maybe even Dark Knight, you know, those things. Yeah. Godfather 2. I know people always, I mean, even though I prefer, I always prefer the first one because that's what got me into it. That's what built the story. But some people always say a oh, sequel is yeah. better. But one franchise that's doing really well is the Fast and the Furious one. Because I noticed it started off good and then it went downhill. And all of a sudden, it's starting going good, good, good. It's making like billions of dollars now. Yeah. It's just, Especially in China. Yeah. China is right now the world's largest consumer of American movies, which is kind of shocking um, to a lot of people. I remember back in, um, when was it? I think 2009, 2010. Well, when did Iron Man 2 come out? That, 2010. Yeah, 2010. Iron Man 2, the, the, the second uh, big Marvel movie, um, it was a big turning point in, in cinema because that is when the Chinese market started really buying up Hollywood films. I think it was before then they only allowed like 30 foreign films to be played in Chinese theaters total per year Uh in the People's Republic of China. And then they started opening up the market more, allowing more films to be played in theaters. And China just started really consuming American films to an accelerated degree to the point where American film producers started thinking, hey, we need to pander more to to Chinese audiences. And so they put these extra scenes in the Chinese version. Yeah, I know Iron Man 3 was like that, where it, 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 um, it's only in China where they had a scene specifically that takes place in China. This is like near the end. Yeah. And whereas in North America or any other parts in the world, they didn't have it. And a lot of my friends were like, oh, is there an extra scene? I was like, yeah, but it's not like a big thing. You can just YouTube it. <laughs> yeah. So they, they had these famous Chinese actors appear in this these extra scenes. And I remember seeing this in the theater. And, and the people in the theater started laughing. It was supposed to be a serious scene, but they started laughing like, what? Uh, why, why is Fun Bing Bing in this one? <laughs> and... Uh, and I, I could see it from their perspective, like, yeah, that was a big jump in uh, in thematic structure in the film. It, it just really wasn't consistent. We're watching an American film, and then all of a sudden we're seeing something you can watch on Chinese television any given day. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's the thing about, and I was actually talking to, when I was back in California, I was talking about this with my with other Americans. And because China is actually, um, in, uh, for Hollywood, it's made, 
like Hollywood wants to always cater to Chinese people, but in order for it to get into China, it needs a reason. So that's why they always have a Chinese actress or actor in it for like five minutes, like Mission Impossible, um, uh, the, the the latest one, the Meg with Jason Statham, the shark, Li Bingbing is in it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, which I'm going to see tomorrow, by the way. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, yeah, but like they always need a reason to get into China, and it's funny because they always put the, the Chinese person's name in the beginning credits. They make it think like they have a big role, but when you watch yeah. the movie, they're only in it for like very short time, and I guess that's good enough for the movie to get into China. <laughs> Yeah, I think the the average moviegoer here in China, though, when they watch an American film, they want to see an American film. They don't want to see like a Chineseified American film. Uh-huh. They they go there to have a this uh, this different experience. Like there was this big controversy recently with McDonald's. McDonald's uh, in Chinese, uh, how do you say it? It's like McDonald's. My, yeah, it sounds like McDonald's, but uh, with Chinese phonemes. And they were going to change their name to however you say, like Golden Arches in Chinese, mm. which is a completely different sound. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, and a lot of the public were just like, "No, that that's dumb." I mean, we we want to go to McDonald's to experience, uh, have an American experience, and eat American hamburgers, and and not to have some like dumbed down Chinese ish thing. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know a lot of Chinese people. They love American products. Not just movies, but like clothing, f- phones, Apple, for example. Yeah. I don't know if this is true or not, but the Apple store in Shanghai, the one on Lu Jiazui, apparently that makes that generates the most profit out of all the Apple stores in the world. Oh wow! And I didn't, I didn't know that. Someone told me. I was like, oh wow! But if you go to an Apple store here in Shanghai or anywhere, there's always it's it's always packed, and yeah. the Chinese people they love. And don't iPhones Apple. cost more here than than most other places? Yeah, yeah, they they cost more here. That, that's why I know some people they always. When they go to the U.S., they buy like so many Apple products, like an iMac, a phone, and an iPad, and they bring it back here. Which is crazy because there are a ton of of very high quality uh, Chinese phones, Chinese made phones, which are much much cheaper. But they want the American product. They want that American experience. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of makes people wonder because you know, there are Chinese phones like Xiaomi, Huawei, and they are good. They're Android. They're Android. Uh, I guess they're on par with Samsung, maybe. Well, arguably, yeah. but anyways, because Apple is dominating the market, that you know, are they really gonna? How long would they keep on? Because they ban other American products like Facebook. Will they ban Apple as well? Hmm. Especially with the trade wars going on between Donald Trump and Xi Jinping. That's a good question, because Apple's had its foot in the door for so long, and it is so popular right now. So it it definitely is a. A threat, if you will, to uh, mm-hmm. to the the Chinese market in that respect. But how do you kick it out when they they're in that deep? Essentially, yeah, that's a good point. Or just like Amazon, because Amazon China is not banned. And I was wondering that. So okay, you you banned Facebook or YouTube, but not Amazon China. But I heard I don't know if it's true or not. But I heard because you know Amazon China does a lot gives a lot of business to like either the Chinese government or something like that. They, they yeah. have, they, there has to be a reason for an American company. Also, Amazon in, in China, in the mainland, it cannot compete with Taobao at oh, all. Oh, yeah, for sure. Taobao is part of Alibaba Group. And um, Taobao is like, like eBay, uh, the Chinese eBay. Yeah, it's like company. eBay on steroids. eBay and yeah. Amazon, everything good about that, but cheaper and better and faster. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's... Not sponsored by Taobao. <laughs> Taobao is, yeah, Taobao is great. And... Um, I was just on Taobao this morning, actually. <laughs> so looking for like yeah, MMA gear, things like that, wrestling gear. Uh, but yeah, but, but yeah, the, there's and it's just like with Facebook because I know there's I know Google is banned in China, but I think there's a Google office in the Shanghai Center or in a, in a World Finance Center. And I was shocked to hear that. I was like, well, Google's banned. Why is it? Why is there an office? And it's a big yeah. office too. And I heard Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Before the whole Congress incident, he also wanted to open uh, an office in Shanghai. Well, yeah, or, or so I heard. There are actually a lot of offices like that. For example, the UFC has had an office in Beijing for over a decade, mm-hmm. and you know because they were not allowed in China. They they um, they just didn't uh, have the rights or whatever. But they had the office there because they were trying to get their foot in the door and. 
And you'll see the same thing like um, uh, the Mormons, for example, my church. Um, we are not an officially recognized church, but we have a branch, oh, okay, which we're not allowed to talk about. Um, <laughs> oh, that, 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 okay, yeah, that, that makes sense then. Like, just Google, and then we've Facebook, got the... Um, trying to get into the door. Yeah, essentially just, just people, you know, just trying to establish a presence and, and, uh, and establish a friendly relationship with the government so that hopefully one day, you know, they can uh, make their make themselves known and, and do what they want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, 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 that's a good point, yeah. Because that, that is a good way to introduce, like, to, like, I guess, introduce the, the product to the Chinese people since the internet, since the internet bans it. It's like, okay, well, here's a hands-on experience yeah. type of it. So, yeah. But, yeah, um, so going back to movies. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because... China, because China, um, it gener- like it generates so much profit that there are s- movies like Warcraft. I'm not yeah. sure if you've seen that. And Need, yeah, I saw that one. Yeah. Saw that one on my Xiaomi box. Okay, yeah. So Warcraft, Need for Speed. Apparently, they made more movie here in China than in the U.S. Yeah, that. I mean, there there are tons of movies that flop in the theaters in America, and uh, people are like, oh, that must not be very good. And then in, in China, it's just huge because, like Warcraft, for example. Um, Massively multiplayer online games, online yeah. gaming is such a huge thing it's here. It's huge in China, and there are so many people in China that it's it's um, man, mm-hmm. it's it's mind boggling. It's it's one thing to say 1.3 billion people, but to actually like look out on like Nanjing Road on any at any yeah. given day and see one million people in front of your eyes is mind boggling. If you've never seen that before, or taking the metro on a yeah. rush hour is is always a nightmare. But you get used to it. Eventually, but again, because like I thought Toronto was big, but when I came here, it was worse. And my parents, when they came here, they were just like, "No, we gotta leave. There's just too many people. They're like yeah. ants everywhere. It's like like that." Oh man, <laughs> Jordan, I got I gotta ask you. Um, being an an Asian Canadian in China, basically having an Asian face but not being Chinese, uh-huh. how what is that like, man? What is that like? It's pre- it's. Pretty funny because, uh, um, but yeah, you get used to it, man. Because a lot of people, when they when I'm at a restaurant or something like that, people always assume that I'm like a Chinese, but I'm a, I'm like a native Chinese speaker, which I'm not. My Chinese is still not that great. Well, it's 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 okay, but whenever I speak to them, they're always like, "Oh, you're a foreigner." I was like, "Cause you have a Chinese face," and I was like, "Yeah," uh, and I I always have to tell them, you know, I'm from Canada, parents from Hong Kong, but I came here, so. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but they, they always get that. They always assume because yeah, they always assume that my Chinese is excellent. So whenever they start speaking to me, like, I can understand like simp- like conversational Chinese. But whenever you talk about business, politics, uh, science, you know, stem cell research, cloning, type, that type of thing, I, I, I would just be like, whoa, like what are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> and I'll just sit there. I'll be like, okay, I'm sorry. Can you speak slower because I, I don't really understand. And they're like, what? You don't understand? Oh, you're a foreigner. And a lot of times they're just like, "Oh, okay, you're a foreigner. You're one of them." <laughs> that type of thing. I was just like, "Oh man, that reminds me of yeah. uh, when I got back from Argentina. I lived there for a few years, and I, I got really, really conversational in in Spanish to the point where I could like mimic accents and stuff. And I felt like I was hot stuff in Spanish. And so I got back to the U.S. and I applied for a job as a translator. And um, so this guy hands me this uh, this. Um, manual that I'm supposed to translate and he's like you can use a dictionary whatever you want I'm like I don't need a dictionary I'm fluent so I sit down I'm like it's this technical manual about um about hemoglobin and uh iron in the blood and and uh agriculture and I'm like how the heck do you say hemoglobin in Spanish oddly enough it's hemoglobin exactly the same spelling just say it with a Spanish accent I had to look that one up but yeah, I realized pretty quickly, uh, yeah, I'm not as fluent as I thought I was. As soon as you start talking about technical things. So how long did you last at that job? I, I didn't get the job. Oh, okay. <laughs> I did not get the job. Okay, so it's kind of like, okay, thanks. <laughs> actually, when I first, actually, um, when I first came to China, because this is when my Chinese was really bad, I applied for a non-teaching job. Uh, it was for a, a clothing company I, I, f- I forgot which one. I think it was Foley Foley. Or, or have you heard of that? Yeah, Foley no. Foley. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a type of store. Okay, I can't remember what kind of they sold. But I remember I went there for the interview and they said, oh, how good is your Chinese? And I was like, oh, it's just, 
it's like medium level and they're like oh okay well uh, if we if we need you we'll call you back and the interview the interview lasted like a minute and i was just like oh okay and i never heard from them again <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. you fully fully uh, we're getting close to the two hour mark here <laughs> <laughs> we we have to say that thing about youtube something i learned since um i my video has got monetized just recently um, if your video is sponsored by an outside sponsor, you have to like check some things to okay that with YouTube or whatever. So that, that's, that's why I keep saying that. Not sponsored by UFC, not sponsored by China, Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah go down the list. <laughs> yeah, we're getting close to the two hour mark here, which is as much uh, space as I have on my recording device there. But um, yeah, Jordan, you have a kind of a cult following among my, my YouTube viewers, they love to see your, your crazy over-the-top antics, your, your wild, stabbing, knifey stuff that you do in these self-defense videos. And people are always asking, when's the next self-defense video with Jordan Chow coming out? So my question is, have, have you seen any amazing self-defense videos that we need to review lately? That CrossFit one. Have you oh, seen that the one? CrossFit one, yeah. You know, that one, I, I thought it got done to death on the internet, but maybe we could put our own spin on it actually there was one i just saw a couple of days ago i remember and it wasn't that bad but i can show it to you okay so you know that there are a lot out there that they're not like that bad but they're not good either like uh -huh. there there are a few people have sent me like there's this one it's basically this girl kicks a guy in the groin and he just stands there and doesn't Gabriel do anything and, um no a diff different girl but um you know, it's it's not the worst thing ever because you know a kick to the groin that's that's obviously going to hurt. But uh -huh. uh, the situations she's presenting are not necessarily uh, realistic, in my opinion. But um, yeah, just kick the groin. <laughs> Viewers out there, if you made it this far into the interview here, um, if you have seen any terrible self defense videos or questionable self defense videos that you would like to see <coughs> us review. Uh, Post a link down in the comments below. We'd love to check it out. All right. Anything else you'd like to say to the viewers at home, Jordan? Uh, yeah, keep watching. We'll make more videos. And go out there and train. Yeah, thanks for watching. Get out there and train, guys. See you next time.